everyone. Um, today is July 7, 2022. Thank you all for joining the Energy Storage Enhancement Meeting for the second revised draft proposal. My name is Brenda Corona, and I will be here from the Stakeholder Affairs Group at the California ISO. I'll be helping facilitate today's meeting, and I'm also joined here by Ali Miriamadi and Gabe Murtoff from the California ISO. And we will go a few um, meeting reminders as well, the agenda. So for today's meeting reminders, um, all related materials found on the stakeholder initiatives page under the energy storage enhancement meeting, as well as this file video will be recorded and be posted publicly to the ISO stakeholder page. Any recording or any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. And these calls are structured to stimulate dialogue and engage different perspectives and please keep comments brief, professional and respectful. We will pause um, for questions after each agenda item listed here below. And if you do have a question, please use the virtual raise hand icon above your chat window in order for us to um, unmute you. And those who are joined only on phone, please press pound two on your device and we will make sure to unmute you. And if you do experience any technical issues, please feel free to send us your chat to all panelists. At this, at this time, we will go ahead and review the agenda for today's call. Um, we will go over um, for the first five minutes the changes from the revised draft proposal. Next, we'll have Ali present us on reliability um, AS operation experience, and then followed up with Gabe going over the other three major topics on the, the second revised draft proposal. And lastly, I'll go over the next step. For this ISO policy initiative stakeholder process, um, it's this typical process is that we post the issue paper, the draft proposal, and then the draft final proposal. Um, today, we're doing the second revised draft proposal, and we're currently before that stage here. Um, next, we plan to do the draft final proposal as well as other um, elements in regarding the proposal development. But at this time, um, we are on track of our initiative and we will go ahead and lead it off to next to open it up to Gabe for the next few topics of this meeting. And then for the timeline here, we have, um, oh, there you are, Gabe. Can we, oh. Thanks, Brenda. Um, sorry, just getting my, getting everything, or trying to get everything unmuted here. Here we go. Um, there it is, okay. So uh, we are currently here. Uh, we just posted our second revised straw proposal on the 30th of June. Um, we're having our stakeholder meeting today on the 7th. We have comments due. We, we did allow two weeks for comments. Um, you know, we realized and we are getting further along in the stakeholder process, but at the same time, um, we wanted to make sure that all stakeholders had enough time to go through the entire document, um, have some time to reflect on not just what's written in the second revised straw proposal, but also have some time um, to digest some of the dialogue uh, that we're hopefully going to have here today in this meeting. And then um, we are planning still to take this to the Board of Governors meeting in October of 2022, which means, you know, in, in, unless there's major changes to the proposal, um, we'll be publishing a draft final proposal in August. That meeting will have the same kind of follow-up that this meeting has where we allow comments, and then we'll be hopefully um, preparing and posting a final proposal in, sometime in September, um, prior to that October 2022 board meeting. Um, and, and that's how we're planning to progress on this timeline. Um, the other thing I would say is, and why don't we advance the next slide, is that we did take a, a very serious look at stakeholder comments and feedback from the last version of the paper that we submitted and I think we also had uh, quite a bit of dialogue with uh, individual and groups of market participants outside of um, the, the formal stakeholder comments process 
And I think the feedback that we got both in the formal written comments and in uh, the external conversations was that the ISO really needs to think hard about how we're planning to evolve potentially the non-generator resource model. And if we're thinking about developing a brand new model, um, I think the, the new model we've been calling the energy storage resource model. Um, if, if we are thinking seriously about evolving that or developing that, um, we really need to roll up our sleeves, figure out what's gonna be the most beneficial aspects of either improvements to the existing model or potentially introducing a new model um, and where stakeholders think they can get the most gains from. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's very unlikely. And I think, I think we here at the ISO recognize this as well, that, we wouldn't be able to have that robust discussion and outline all the things that are needed in the new model and meet this um, deadline to get to an October uh, board date. At the same time, I, I think the feedback that we got from stakeholders is that a lot of these reliability issues and certainly the issues around the co-located model are things that are incredibly important, uh, very high value and high impact. And if we could get those implemented sooner and get them, you know, kind of keep them on track to be developed as quickly as possible, I think there was a lot of drive um, to have that as well. So with that in mind, um, what we're planning to do is start a second stakeholder initiative. It's, it's going to be called something different. It might be storage modeling enhancements. It might be called something similar to that. But essentially, there's going to be another stakeholder process. Um, I don't think we're going to start from scratch from, from, say, an issue paper. I think we're likely to build off of the work that we've already done in this initiative, thinking about new and evolving storage models. Um, but I do think we want to continue to engage stakeholders in the process. So, you know, instead of the ISO writing a paper and saying, hey, this is what we think about uh, model evolution, I think instead what we're going to do is um, have at least one workshop, maybe two workshops. Hopefully, you know, we'll be thinking about hosting those sometime later this summer. Um, I think in an ideal world, um, we would potentially host those meetings on site at, at the ISO, but I, I'm being told that there's a lot of logistical challenges still to doing that. Um, so, so that they may still continue to be virtual. Um, but, but I think that the very first step in that process would be to have um, workshops that, and, and again, try to foster this dialogue between the ISO and parties outside of the ISO and, and really think hard about what we wanna do with either the existing model or a new model or potentially both. Um, with that said, that does reduce the scope of this policy. Uh, I think with the timeline that Brenda just outlined, uh, hopefully we will not be going the full, two hour, uh, the full three hours today um, we, we have the time if we need it, and I'm happy to talk through any of these issues if, if there's questions or things that still need to be worked out. Uh, but I think for the most part, most of these issues are things that we've already spent a lot of time on in the past, and it, it's ground that we've covered. Um, I, I think there are still probably some things to be worked out with the ancillary services proposal, but hopefully we're getting pretty close on some of the other aspects of this proposal. Um, and, and, you know, we are sort of in path to be able to get to that o October uh, Board of Governors date for final approval and then on to FERC. Um, so just on the lines of other changes from the first revised straw proposal to this paper, we did think about some changes to ancillary services um, and changes to reliability and you know, specifically, we are proposing um, updates to the state of charge formula. That was something that we had talked about in the first revised straw proposal. And when we had those discussions, you know, it, it, it was essentially a few paragraphs in the last paper. Um, and we talked a little bit about it in our previous meeting. Um, but we are planning to, uh, you know, we, we do have a formal proposal in this paper for those changes. And we, we are planning to walk through those today. So that's new content um, that we haven't previously formally proposed, uh, although we have talked about it at a high level. Um, 
we've also thought a lot about, and, and I know we got a lot of feedback on the requirements that we were talking about in the first revised draw proposal. Um, we are still planning to uh, and proposing to impose new requirements on storage resources that are providing ancillary services. Um, I think, you know, we have in the past stated that the operations team has been having some difficulty monitoring and um, you know, accessing ancillary services, particularly reg up and reg down, when storage resources have been committed, uh, particularly for multiple hours during a day, um, and there can be some challenges to that. I've, I've brought Ali uh, Mirmadi in today to talk a little bit about those challenges, and we don't necessarily have robust data on every day when something like this is happening. What we've done is sort of flagged a typical day and just, just to give a little bit of a flavor of, hey, hey, this is a typical operating day and these are the kinds of things that we're seeing from storage resources during some points in that day. And I think that's the part of our goal there is to illustrate how serious this is for our operations team. And I think a need for both the ISO to have dependable resources at which we think storage could certainly meet those expectations, providing ancillary services, and at the same time, um, ensure that when storage resources do qualify for regulation up or regulation down, that they know they're gonna be able to provide those services to the ISO. Um, so so in, I, ideally this will help uh, both the ISO and, and market participants who are, who are bidding in these requirements and um, you know, wanting to provide these services to the ISO. Um, we've also included, um, just, just a note here, we've included some additional analysis in the paper. Um, I don't have a, a full slide on that analysis here that I'm planning to present today, um, but at, at the very highest level, we, we can talk a little bit about that in this presentation. Um, compensation for uh, exceptional dispatch to hold state of charge. We got some, I think, pretty good feedback on how we could improve those counterfactuals that the ISO was counting or um, uh, calculating to uh, come up with total compensation when storage resources are awarded an exceptional dispatch to hold state of charge. So um, we, we've implemented those and, and we've included those in the uh, proposal. Specifically, um, we are you know, thinking about um, locational marginal prices and bids when we are uh, making dispatch instructions and in both counterfactuals. So it's not just, um, you know, which counterfactual, you know, could you potentially or theoretically earn the highest revenues? It's which, which counterfactual could you earn the highest revenues when you're being dispatched above what your bids are um, uh, to discharge energy from a storage resource. And I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, the second piece of feedback that we got that I think we've um, done a pretty good job with is uh, is extending the horizon to the end of the day. Um, I think there were some market participants who said, you know, maybe even the end of the day wouldn't be long enough. Um, but I think some market participants did, did state that the duration of the battery, which is what we initially proposed, uh, may be challenging and it may not incorporate all of the time periods that really should be looked at when we're thinking about exceptional dispatches. Um, so we, we've, we've, you know, I, I think gotten to a point where we feel comfortable with expanding the calculation to go all the way through the end of the day. Um, this also helps on our, our settlement side. Um, once you start spanning over multiple days with settlements, um, things computationally can be trickier. We have to bring in more data, um, which which can be a can be a challenge or, or a big lift from our systems perspective. Um, finally, the co-located model, and I think, you know, we I, I've, I've talked a lot about the feedback that we got on the first revised straw proposal, but I think almost all parties who commented commented on the co-located model, and they commented on some of the challenges facing resources that are either already integrated onto the system or are planning to integrate onto the system. And a lot of those challenges do focus on um, contractual obligations that they have or contractual obligations that they may have in the future. And um, 
the restrictions that the ISO had originally envisioned um, for this alternate co-located model that would essentially avoid uh, grid charging were just, I, 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 think, I think the comments were basically that, that those weren't workable or they'd be very difficult for most resources. Um, so what we've done is we've sort of reimagined this and I think essentially we've dropped all the restrictions on being able to participate on the ISO grid uh, with a co-located model. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that at the very end of the presentation. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe I'll pause real quick, Brenda, to see if we have any questions on the line. Um, let's not uh, have questions on content of the presentation because we're gonna get into more detail on all of these sections later in the presentation. Uh, but if there's any comments or questions on process or um, maybe maybe just generally uh, ISO feedback, that sort of thing, I, I think we could listen to those now. Um, but if, it, if it's questions specific to content, like you wanna talk about ancillary services or something, let's save that until we get into the sections. We do have Alva from pg and &E. right. Um, let's double check. Alva, we're going to have uh, your online mute unmuted. So you guys can go ahead and unmute. Go yes. Alva, right yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I was successfully unmuted. Thank you. And I, and I will keep to your request there, Gabe. The one item that I feel, uh, because of the these everything to do with storage is, is uh, there's a lot of moving parts. It's important in my mind to keep them all in one place. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm concerned that the uh, the uh, issue of uh, real-time settlements, which might also have an effect on how real-time storage is optimized, yep. is in the pricing enhancements initiative. In my opinion, yep. that should be part of this initiative. It should not be. It, it's it's distracting and it's it's also concerning that it's being separated. So that's my only comment at this point. Okay. I think this is a great, great scope. Otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Alva. Um, I, you know, I worry a little bit about. I, I'm obviously very involved in the price formation initiative, and we have a meeting coming up on that. I believe next week on Tuesday. Um, I, I, I kind of worry about the scope of that project because there's a lot of really meaty topics in there. Big cost recovery, to me, seems like it's a little bit of a better fit. Um, in another initiative rather than this initiative because it does touch on other resources outside of storage. And we wanna think holistically about, you know, how it impacts gas resources, how it impacts other resources on the grid. Um, but, but your point is well taken that this is an issue raised by the storage community. It is something that they've asked us to address. Um, but, but I think at this point, the home is gonna be price formation um, yeah. right now, yeah. I, but I want to point out that really, and I thought the presentation that was done by the gentleman the last time he had was excellent because it, it made it clear to me that it's not really a calculation after the fact. It's a question of how the optimization is done for specifically for storage. And I think that's why that part of it should really be in, in scope here. Not necessarily, you know, settlements, calculations, but the idea of whether you're going to optimize uh, you're going to give the given a battery the option to be optimized strictly yep. within the hour or over the horizon that's not a that's not a bcr question that's okay. a question of the storage model in my mind yeah yeah so i i think i think that's a good point too um i i think my my other <laughs> and final piece of feedback on this would be that we you know likely because of the lift of something like mm -hmm. that. And I, and I think probably okay. the amount of discussion that we'd still wanna have on something like that, um, it probably doesn't fit best with this proposal. It would probably be something like a phase two or maybe maybe that's something true. to discuss. Um, that's at a later true. And there, may be th there may be things out of this that don't get right. implemented immediately as well. I yeah. just think yeah. you should sort of think of it in terms of storage modeling, uh, you know, how, yeah. however that gets, modified over time, it's not really a, yeah. a, a fundamentally a price formation issue. So thanks yeah. thanks for listening to my comment, I appreciate no, it. No, th thank you for bringing that up, Alva. I really appreciate it. And um, I, I'll certainly keep that in mind. And as we interface you know, with senior leadership here at the ISO, we'll, we'll bring this up to them just in terms of where 
they want to see certain issues tackled. And then we'll certainly have those internal conversations uh, with the price formation team. Um, any other comments, Brenda? We do have one more from okay, Carrie Bentley. Um, Shreya, can you go ahead and unmute Carrie Bentley from WPTF? Hi, this is Carrie Bentley from the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, so, first of all, thanks, Gabe. I think this is a great scope and great direction um, for the initiative in general. I had actually a, a somewhat similar comment to Alva. Um, I, I think um, the scope is appropriate in the different initiatives, but like him, I'm having trouble tracking, and I know many of our members are having trouble tracking. So I just have a practical suggestion, and maybe other stakeholders in their comments can include other practical suggestions. And that's within the storage page that you already have on the website. You just link to all the different initiatives that relate to storage. Um, because you do have, you know, a page under stay informed or participate or something like that, that is just exclusively storage. Yeah. And I know that's the first touch point that my members go to, but it doesn't link to all these initiatives. That might help. Great. Yeah, that, that's really great feedback, Carrie. Thanks. Um, I'll certainly look into doing something like that. I, I think that would be helpful as well. Thanks, Gabe. Okay, uh, Shreya, any other comments? There's no comments. We can go ahead and proceed. Um, I will turn it over to Ali then um, to present some of his findings on um, storage resources that are receiving regulation awards. Ali? Thank you, Gabe. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ali Miramadi, and um, I'm in Infrastructure and Operations Planning Division. And as part of my responsibilities, um, I get involved and engage with low-level events and investigate them and try to improve our process, systems, or um, people um, training that might be needed to eliminate um, what I call landmines within, within our, uh, our operations. And about a month ago, uh, system operations approached me and asked me if I could do, um, if I could look into uh, some of these storage units, uh, reg up and reg down, performance and get to see if there are ways that we can improve um, the performance of the storage units. And I developed some models uh, internally that, that looks at unit specific performance and then started getting involved and engaged with scheduling coordinators to better understand uh, the, the root causes of some of the behaviors we're seeing um, uh, at, at, at the system level. and. Uh, and in one of those uh, conversations, and typically we try to invite Gabe as well, um, Gabe asked me last week uh, to see if I could provide maybe a one-day perspective um, on uh, how the storage units under regulation perform and perhaps even compare it to some other units, thermal units or other units. Uh, to that end, uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, uh, I developed a model that we can now run on a daily basis that, that looks at uh, the performance of, of the storage units. Uh, this is uh, 628 last week, uh, randomly picked the day. It was actually just based on when uh, Gabe asked me. It was the first day that we actually we developed the model uh, that we had data for, so we just ran it for that one day. And uh, for purpose of this stakeholder meeting, just um, uh, included the uh, data to, in, in these slides. And what you do see here is um, uh, uh, four second data. And uh, this is only for the storage units that were on regulation at that period of time. Now, uh, units come on regulation and go off regulation. This only looks at the uh, deviations for the units that were on regulation and they would receive the set point, a regulating uh, uh, our, our AGC send out a set point to the unit and the deviation of the unit, <clears throat> excuse me, from that set point. Um, and all the positive deviations were aggregated on, and, and that's the orange line, all the negative deviations were, were aggregated and that would be the blue line. And I, uh, 
I'd like to just do a deep dive uh, on um, one of those um, four second uh, uh, data points. And that was essentially 105944, uh, which was, we saw a 140 megawatt deviation um, uh, from touch point from the storage units. Uh, that would be essentially our ending 11 uh, uh, interval for RTPD, um, interval for uh, awards that went out to the regulating units. At that interval, uh, there were 28 storage units that received rec down awards. Um, and we had procured uh, approximately, I think, 930 megawatts of breakdown. And there were four other units um, outside of uh, storage uh, that were also awarded breakdown to the tuner. I think, I think the storage units got about 600 megawatts of breakdown. And, and then we had thermal, one thermal, two hydro, and one dynamic that received 330 megawatts of breakdown. And, um, and then I, did a deep dive on the logs as well, just to see if the operators had, had indicated anything on that day. And it turned out to be a quite eventful day for the operators as well in that day um, uh, at approximately 10 a.m. Uh, started notifying one storage unit that they were not following their set point. And after several notifications, they forced the unit into a buyback position. And, um, and then later, uh, at, at, at approximately, uh, I think I, they had a second unit that they had to interact with multiple times and force it back into a buyback position, which was at 1045. Uh, that log um, was recorded at 1045. And then another one at 1136 and another one at 12, 1230. So there were four storage units that received multiple interactions from the operators and ultimately were forced into the buyback. And what I found out was you, what, what you do get is in, you know, the first unit that was forced into the buyback, uh, I believe it's around this time frame, was a smaller unit that was, again, not following the set point. And the second unit was right around here. This, what you see, so, deviations here, which was accounting for approximately 50 megawatts of the deviations, and ultimately was forced into a buyback. And the third unit, and then the fourth unit uh, were later uh, in the day. Uh, I did not look at those intervals, I just uh, uh, letting you know that there were th those were four, uh, four of the units that were actually uh, forced into the buyback, of storage units that were forced into the buyback um, time, in, 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 in those time frames. And as you know, uh, you know, we're getting into the summertime and there's a lot for the operators to do in real time. And this is not something that historically they were forced into uh, uh, getting engaged with. I mean, I've been looking at blogs for a good 10 years, and um, uh, this is becoming a more frequent event lately. And I have to emphasize that this day was not picked because uh, it was a worst day or, 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 or not. And we, I just randomly went with the latest date, date that I had data on and uh, based on interaction with the op one of the operators, they said this was a typical day. Um, not the worst, not the best, but a typical day that they do encounter. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, looking into that one interval, uh, there were, again, there were 28 units uh, under storage and, and most were behaving well, uh, but all of those deviations that you saw in the previous slide for that one interval, uh, what really can be more than 90% of those deviations can be, can be attributed to five units, five storage units, one of which was forced into a buyback uh, because they were just not responding at all. And then for that same interval, there were four other units outside of the storage that got the rec down award. Um, and, uh, and you can see the relative uh, deviation that we're experiencing uh, by, by the units. And over here, what, what you do see is the four units, two, one was thermal, two hydro, and one dynamic relative deviation from set point. And then over here, you can see uh, the relative devi deviation for, uh, from set point for the top five uh, deviators on the storage side. 
and um, and 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 I and this is what the operators experienced and wanted to kind of um, I guess for me to investigate and and get involved and engage with the units that they they were uh, uh, identifying as not performing uh, to find out what 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 the root cause of uh, non-performance was. So this is kind of like a highlight overview of um, one day. Again, I want to emphasize we didn't pick this day because we thought it was one of the worst days. It, from what I've heard from the operators, this was one of the typical days. And as you can see, storage is an important part of our equation today. I mean, we had 28 units that, that were selected for rec down versus four of other technology types or uh, field types, I should say. Uh, so it, it storage is becoming a bigger, bigger, and a bigger part of our, our, our daily lives. And it's important that uh, we get the uh, equation, whatever uh, the, the success is here, right in order to get uh, the uh, units performing well under regulation. Uh, with that, I want to open it up for any questions on the two slides I presented. We do have one question raised first by Susan Snyder from Phoenix Consulting. Let's go ahead and unmute Susan for her question. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. hi Susan. Yeah, I can. Ellie. Okay, I had, um, this is very interesting. Um, I just had a couple of, of clarifying questions. Um, first of all, it looks like you're having issues with reg down. Um, are you also having issues with reg up or is it mostly reg down? Uh, on the interval that I chose to, to do a deep dive was on reg down. Uh, but we are having reg up problems as well. There are, my, my personal experience with having done this for now about a month at unit specific level, uh, yes, it's either reg up or reg down depending on where the SOC is uh, at the time of the, uh, 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 I guess the set point being sent out by the, by, by the AGC unit. AGC. Okay, so since the AGC is sending out the signals, so are you, are you attributing, and, and I apologize, this is, this is obvious, but are you attributing the deviations from the fact like for reg down, do they not have enough, um, do they not, can they not back off on, I mean, what, what is it that's making, I mean, it's reg up and maybe you don't have enough spate of charge to provide it. Reg down, is it that you can't, you're already full and you can't, I mean, you, you can't go down the other way or what, what exactly is, is how does the state of charge interact with the deviation, I guess, is my question. Yes, yeah, so I, um, first I want to clarify that um, I, I can provide you my opinion, but uh, I think uh, that the correct answer resides with the unit operators. And uh, I, I don't want to kind of uh, imply that I under, fully understand what the unit operators are experiencing, but what I see from the data, that is correct. Um, they do get to a point where uh, they're not willing their SOC to either get further charged or further depleted. And, um, and, and that may not be 100% or that may not be zero, uh, but there definitely is. Um, so uh, say, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, I no, was no, say, I, I just, yeah. I, I just wanted to say sometimes um, the data is not as clear cut because there might be, for lack of a better term, a soft cap on where the SOC is allowed to go. Uh, that may not be reflected in the bid or um, that uh, may not be picked up by our market. I mean, when I do the deep dive, I give you an example on one of the units. Uh, the unit um, uh, was essentially, the SOC was essentially full, was at, uh, but it was showing at 90% on our side. Uh, but when, you, when I did a historical trend on that unit SOC as a percent of max, uh, they seldom went above 90. So it might not have, been, you know, we may have looked at it and said, well, you had another 10% of SOC, but the unit, for whatever reason, and those are the reasons that I cannot, you know, mm -hmm. further opine on, um, essentially was not willing to go beyond 90%. So possibly it might be a master file issue or something like that to uh, the, charge, it, the charging range. However you want to term it, it, it is an SOC 
from my perspective, my interpretation is an SOC issue. Uh, and then there are other examples where we do see 100% of max or zero being reached, where the unit is not able to um, uh, provide the reg. So uh, I, I gave you one example where it, it, it was kind, it was kind of I was speculating it was SOC related, and then there are other examples where it, from my perspective, is definitely SOC related. I was looking at the unit yes, just yesterday where it hit 100% of max and it could not um, provide any more breakdown. And we see it on the opposite end as, as well. Uh, the first unit that I actually did investigate and contacted a scheduling coordinator ended up getting to a zero and, and not being able to provide. And, and I wanted to understand how that happened. Why did that happen? And was it the bid that they submitted, was it the award, and why was the award submitted, and then ultimately the zero um, uh, SOC reached. And these are some of the questions that we try to ask and get to the bottom of in our investigation. Okay, and and, and again, again, I apologize, this is a stupid non-engineer question, but so the reg, the reg signal goes out to them automatically through through AGC, and if, if, they're, if they're deviating from that, does that mean they're, are they disabling the equipment or doing, because normally you think the equipment would just do, is, 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 it, is that why you think it's a state of charge limitation as opposed to some other thing? Um, it's, you know, it just seems like normally the equipment just has to follow the signal, right? But in this case, it, it, you're, you're assuming it's just not able to, because you talked about not being willing to do something, and I wasn't really sure how that applies to AGC. Right, so what, what, what I do see and ha happens often is uh, the unit is following the set point pretty well. And then it hits a certain level and then it no longer follows the set point. And our AGC unit sends, sends a signal and keeps sending it and then it goes what we, what, what, what we call from an EMS perspective into a standby and then tries again, and after a few minutes, to to set to to, to move the unit to where the EMS wanted to go, and and that gets repeated, and that could that dance can happen for a whole hour, and unless the operator takes action and say, okay, we're forcing a buyback, our EMS continuously tries to move that unit, and for whatever the reason, again, I'm not at the at the plant side, mm -hmm. um, the unit is is not. It's not moving, and okay. uh, whereas it was behaving quite well and following the set point, and then all of a sudden it kicks in. I can tell you, like one unit, um, problems started around 6 a.m. for whatever the reason. And, and next week I'm going to be contacting the unit to talk to them to understand what goes on at 6 a.m. But some are most are SOC, from what I see is SOC related. There might be a small percentage that they're other issues that are driving the behavior. Um, but from what I'm seeing, my, my uh, interpretation of the data I see is mostly SOC related. Okay, okay, and then just one more question. When you, when you talk about a unit being forced into a buyback, or you're, are you saying basically you're sort of clawing back the ancillary services award and um, you know, sort of buying something else, or, and then they have, to, you know, they have to basically pay it back, or what, what, what do you, is that what you mean? I don't believe that's what clawback is. Is I've always associated with a kind of a like compliance thing where they we, we go back and take the money away from the last time they were looked at. I don't think we're doing a clawback. When the operator says a buyback, they're just forcing the market to drop that unit and pick another unit instead um, okay. at the Does next the unit, RTB unit. interval. Doesn't the unit have to just give back the? Doesn't the unit doesn't have to give back the payment for that hour though, right? I mean, I I, I mean, I've used the right term, but I I am not sure about the settlement side of it, Susan. I I have not looked into whether or not um, the capacity payment um, is withdrawn for that hour, but I know that that unit, let's say, if it was awarded for mm -hmm. four hours, or it was going to be awarded for four hours, then uh, it, it no longer would, you know the the market will no longer pick that unit uh, for the next. So essentially, you, you, it gets replaced by another unit. And if if you kind of can we go back to the previous slide, uh, 
Ben? Yeah, let me let me maybe interject here a little bit, Ali. Um, I, I don't want to go too far afield in this conversation. I, I think the point of what we're trying to illustrate here is, you know, we're. I, I, I think the first thing is we're not going out and, and and cherry picking a day here. This is just you know one day in operations from from just a couple days ago, where the ISO operations team saw deviation from those set point descriptions. And as we're digging into it, we're finding that that deviation is, you know, is mainly attributable to storage resources. And we believe, and I think this is some of what Ali's saying, that some of that deviation is attributable to state of charge. Maybe not all of it, but, but at least some of it. And I think what, what we're trying to do here in this presentation is just to illustrate that this might be the reason why the ISO may want to impose some of these rules that we've been talking about and discussing in these meetings um, in terms of regulate, uh, you know, regulation awards that storage resources should be allowed to have or not potentially. Right, and I want to be clear. I'm not. I'm not questioning the veracity of the data or the or the or the you know the issue. Okay. The issue. I just want to make sure I understood the statement. So that's all yeah. the only reason I was asking. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll let, let it go then, and and uh, you know look forward to the rest of the presentation. Thanks. And, and I we appreciate the the feedback, Susan. And I think, you know, from our end, you know, we don't have all the answers. Um, and and we've been working. You know, Ali and his team have been working incredibly hard on reaching out to market participants. And I know that this has been, I, I, th I think that this is a source of frustration on both sides. I think the storage operators are, are frustrated about some of the tools that the ISO has and some of the instructions that they're receiving. And I know that our operations team is frustrated and, and frankly concerned about reliability um, because when you have, you know, when you've procured what, 900 megawatts of um, an ancillary service and 150 megawatts don't show up in one particular, you know, we're looking at, I, I think, a four second slice here uh, for these little lines or, or something like that. Uh, when they, when, it, when a, a bunch of your regulation that you procure doesn't show up, then you've got all kinds of other problems. You know, maybe they have to go out and procure more, which can be a big hassle and they can, you know, that, that, that that's a, a challenge for them. Um, so I, I, I think we're just trying to, you know, get the dialogue going here and, and, and be a little bit more illustrative of what our problems are. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Thanks very much. No, thanks, Susan. Um, Brenda, I think you noted that there may be a few other hands up. Um, I, I, I know we're, I, we, we do have a lot of time today. Um, I, I certainly want to allow everybody the time, time to speak. Um, maybe if we could just quickly run through if, if there's clarifying comments or other issues um, that folks are raising on this. We did have two in the chat that were submitted early on. Okay. And we want to go to those first because they were submitted first. Um, sure. The first one was from C.D. McLean from CC. On this slide, how far away in time was the similarly sized positive deviation? Uh, can you repeat, read that again, Brenda? I'm sorry. How far away was in time? How, yeah, in time was the similarly sized positive deviation. Okay, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to take have... a guess. At, yeah, I, I, I want to point out that every bar here is four seconds, um, but I, I, I'm not sure if I understand what the nature of the question is. So, Ali, I think the, the out, you know, we, we've got this green arrow pointing towards a, a blue line um, that, that's pretty steep in the negative direction, and that's the, the 1059.44 timestamp that we looked at. Um, right. Just to the right of that timestamp, there's an orange deviation that goes oh, up in I the see. positive direction. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Uh, so, I don't, I, I can go and pull up the spreadsheet to take a look at, but. Um, I'm not 100% sure exactly if that's the next four seconds or not. My guess would be um, that what you're seeing is um, the uh, that you have a little bit of the deviation that happened here. Switch over to the positive side, depending because if it's in top of the hour, depending on on 
uh, one or two units on how they were moving. That's, again, a complete case. I didn't look at that um, interval at all. And that could kind of explain a little bit of the deviation that you see here. Um, switching over to the positive side, depending on how quickly a, a unit, one or two units move uh, at the top of the hour compared to their set point. Okay, great. Um, Brenda, did, did we have one other question? Yes, from Brian Buffalo <laughs> from Rev Renewables. Um, the question is, did these units have real-time energy bid curves for the full, ca full capacity submitted? And second is, what specific threshold trigger the disqualification and clawback? I don't know. I did not look into that. And I just looked at the regulation awards in the RTPD to see which units had received the award so I can look at the unit-specific information to figure out who was deviating. And as far as the uh, uh, clawback, uh, again, I uh, didn't get involved and engaged with that. I don't think there has been a clawback associated with any of these um, deviations uh, currently, or, or I, I would even guess in recent past. So, yeah, and I think um, yeah, I, I think we're we're mixing and matching a little bit here. Um, what Ali is analyzing is those those four second instructions that um, our AGC systems are sending to resources that have regulation awards. Um, so this is happening even within you know <laughs> as close as you can possibly get to real time. So so we're doing this every four seconds, and that's the data that we're looking at here. Um, when we're talking about potentially clawing back ancillary service awards in the real-time market, that's happening in the RTPD, the 15-minute market. And, and those, uh, you know, th those are, are market um, results that would happen, you know, 38 minutes prior to an actual time, uh, you know, an operational time for the resource. Um, so I, I, th I think we're mixing and matching just a little bit. Uh, Brenda, were there any other questions? We do have raised hands. Would you like to go through the four four people that we have um, waiting maybe, for the? Yeah, if 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 we've got just a brief, maybe maybe just a question or a comment from from those folks, um, I'm happy to hear those. Okay, everyone. So for those, um, we're going to start with Carrie Bentley from WPTF. Please keep your comments brief if you can. You're on of mute. Of course. Oh, thanks, uh, Carrie Bentley, WPTF. So thanks. I think this is an excellent example of the consequences of not modeling state of charge and day ahead. So I understand why you're presenting this. Um, just for uh, reference, though, I wanted to quickly go through the reasons why this could be occurring from our perspective. First, Ali, you noted physical limitations, but then there's two others that have different um, I guess, different market designs that could solve. So I think they're important to look into as you continue your analysis. Um, the first one is being unwilling to provide regulation once they hit a certain state of charge. So as you articulated that one resource that had that soft cap of 90%, um, your proposal that you're about to go through, I don't think will fix that issue. Um, just accounting for state of charge and day ahead won't address the issue that people have different willingness to provide AF at different state of charge. So I think that's just something to note for the next initiative. Um, and then the next one kind of relates to the Rev Renewable comment. And that's that um, on this day in particular, I happen to know that there was a, a big price spike in the day ahead market um, later in the evening. Um, and so if someone had an energy award um, a day ahead energy award, they would want to make sure that they were charged sufficient to meet their day ahead award because they wouldn't have wanted to buy that back in real time. So you can't really just look at regulation in isolation. Um, you have to look at it within the context of any day ahead awards they have and their real time energy bid curves. Um, so as you continue the analysis um, and assess whether the CAISO's proposal really will solve this issue, um, I'd really encourage you to start pulling in those day ahead and real time energy bids and prices, because I think it will help you really understand what the resources are doing. That's Thanks, all. Terry. I, I think both of those are excellent points. Um, and I do think on our end, uh, we, we probably do need to do more looking at the data and, mm -hmm. and have those conversations with uh, battery operators. Yeah, thanks. And then the word you're looking for is no pay. 
AS in the 15 minute market, if they have insufficient state of charge um, compared to the rules, then they get a, a no pay, which is essentially a clawback, but yep. the, the term is no pay if you're looking for it in the BPMs. Yep, thanks, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Next, we have Mark Smith from Calpine. Let's go ahead. Hey, Ali. Um, I have a pretty simple question on page eight. Um, and it's <clears throat> in your data, you show that the reg award here, and this is right down, is 20, but the deviation is minus 47. How can the deviation be greater than the award? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, so I looked into that. Um, and what, so let, let, let's just make a very simple um, exercise here. Let's, let, let's say that the um, day ahead award was around zero for the unit. And at that point, it provided a uh, 20 rec down, which means it's willing to go down to negative 20 uh, or charge for 20 megawatts if needed. And, and at the time of the deviation, the unit was um, at uh, negative 67, or I, actually negative 47, um, which means that it was charging way beyond where the reg was. And the uh, EMS was trying to move it back to zero because that's where uh, the the uh, day ahead um, uh, dot was, and that's where the dot was, either from day ahead or the energy bit, and um, to start to position the unit for uh, providing uh, regulation rec down. And the unit was way past where it was supposed to be. So the uh, deviation that gets recorded that we see is at negative 47 compared to where it was supposed to be. And the set point kept trying to move the unit back to where where it needed it to be, which which was at this juncture around zero, and the unit was at neg at negative 47, charging at 47 megawatts when it should have been just just at zero. Okay, I, I guess that goes back to Kerry's question because I mean this isn't this is a deviation to the to the reg down award, <clears throat> but it's an imbalance to the energy bids also. It goes beyond the capacity award in reg. Um, so well, I think I, it's, yeah, right. you, you, if, if I may say the, the so our EMS looks at that unit and says this is where you're supposed to be, and I need you here so I can move you, and the unit is not, and it's not responding to where it, it is supposed to be. So that is that is a negative for some regulation from a regulation perspective as to what the incentives or what the cause was, I don't have an answer for that. And, and Kerry has raised a good point that we need to look into that as well um, uh, from, a, from a financial perspective. And uh, typically what my investigation does is contact the unit and say, what were the good causes? And rather than just us try to speculate, I'd, I'd like to hear from the, from the scheduling coordinator or from the unit itself to, un, to better understand that dynamic that, that's occurring. Okay, thanks, Alan. Thank you, Mark. We have Alva from pg and &E. Let's go ahead and get your quick question. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, excellent uh, report out, Ali. Um, I, um, I think I've, uh, since this is being used as a something of a you know a stalking horse for the changes that are being going to be talked about i do want to raise one basic issue here which is that there is the before making changes in market model there's a question of whether all the participants understand essentially the tariff and what is required in order to provide regulation on one reading of this and i'm and i'm not saying i have the right reading because i think we can speculate a lot about what's going on here um, th these resources are in danger of de being decertified for regulation. And if they're not going to respond, if they're deliberately or due to inaccuracy not responding to regulation instructions, that is one of the consequences that should be seen there. So um, if, and, and I heard speculation on your part that a lot of this is the battery operators themselves taking unilateral action if uh, that may or may not be the case, but if they are, then there are clear um, rules that maybe have not been, uh, people have not been educated enough about, about what happens when you violate the tariff. 
or, or when you don't perform according to requirements. And I think we want to make sure that we take those first steps before we start putting uh, requirements into the market model that may lead to other types of distortions. Um, so that's one comment. The other comment I wanted to make just as, as a speculation is uh, I'm pretty sure most battery operators are aware of the fact that they are essentially going to lose their, if they have been told, and this may not happen in fact at all times, that their reg awards will be uh, rescinded, whether that's curtailed or bought back or, or no paid, if their state of charge um, buffer in the, in this case, in the, in the charging direction is less than a half hour's worth of state of charge. And so a battery operator could in fact set a limit on its state of charge in an attempt to keep that buffer. And it, it could lead to exactly the opposite effect from what they would expect to have, which is that you're gonna basically tell them they're um, misbehaving and they're gonna get a deviation on their, on their regulation. But in fact, it's possible for battery operators to see these rules and, and say, I need to preserve half an hour of state of charge in both directions in order to be able to provide regulation. So I think there's a question of whether the rules have really been understood and whether you need to do more education um, of battery operators about what's required to provide regulation, um, even aside from anything, any actions that the ISO might find itself having to take inherently because of the, the nature of storage. I think you're right on Alpha, um, and and that 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 was part of my one of the hypotheses I was trying to pursue. The challenge I face is I have to interact with a scheduling coordinator, who who most of the time my experiences do not necessarily understand what what you just talked about from from a plant operator perspective, and and I I, I think I think you raise a very valid point here, but I don't have uh, uh, I, I just started this process. I don't have enough data point to say um, you're right on. That's one of the strongest hypotheses that I'm trying to pursue. And, and I'm hoping that the scheduling coordinators will have the proper interaction with the plan operator to make sure that we, we all understand um, the behaviors and, uh, and the dynamics at play here. Yeah, and I applaud your efforts. Thank you. Next. Next, we have Cody Hale from Rev Renewable. So we just have like, we're gonna cut off at 10.05. So Cody, go ahead. Two minutes, thanks Brenda. Um, hi, Ali, hi, hi Gabe. Um, so just, uh, Ali, you know, great presentation here. I, I agree with what you have shown you know, from the resource operator's perspective. It, you know, th this looks just like stuff that we have experienced, you know, m many times, you know, hundreds of times going back over the last few years on, on at particular intervals. Um, I, I do want to echo the one comment from, uh, like it was Carrie, that, um, you know, the proposal here may not necessarily um, solve the problem. I, I, th I think, um, you know, limiting day ahead awards will certainly help, and, and we've actually been in favor of, of limiting day ahead awards because um, there is some low-hanging fruit there in, in fixing that. But um, the thing that does not seem to be addressed, and I'm interested if, if you guys can, you know, maybe pick up on it later, um, is uh, dynamic charging limits. So I, I would say that we have never um, been unwilling to respond to a, a KISO dispatch, but sometimes we are unable and sometimes KISO does give us infeasible dispatches. And we have a lot of comments we've submitted over the years on that, that uh, you know you can't charge a battery at a high rate of power when it is almost full, 90 plus percent. So your example is a perfect one, um, but there's no way to convey that to KISO either through the master file uh, or through any other means currently, and, and that seems like something um, that should be prioritized here and, and would, would in fact fix your problem. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that not being in the uh, current straw proposal is something that uh, uh, maybe can still get picked up. I think you're looking at the right problem, but uh, you're yeah. missing the main tool for it. Yeah, Cody, um, you know, we've, you know I, I know you and I have talked about this particular aspect of of some of the challenges that resources have faced. And I've had conversations offline with others as well about this issue. Um, so the ISO is certainly aware of it. Um, I, I think, you know, with with bandwidth and with where we are right now, the challenges to charging at high states of charge or discharging at low states of charge 
is going to have to be addressed in the next initiative that we're teeing up, um, which, you know, I, I, I think we'd likely, you know, I, I, I hate to throw this out there, but we'd likely be looking at something like a 2024 implementation, whereas this policy we're hoping uh, for a 2023 implementation. Uh, obviously, the ISO has a ton of other stuff going on, uh, so it all needs to be prioritized sort of in the grand scheme of things. But senior management here at the ISO certainly recognizes that storage is a growing component of, um, you know, the, the tools that the operations team has to be able to operate the grid reliably. We want to get the right market uh, mechanisms in place so that we can operate these things reliably. You know, they, they, they can, you know, we want the storage resources to be able to do what they're telling us through their bids and their limits that they can do. And at the same time, we want to have uh, the market tools in place that accurately reflect the kinds of things uh, that these resources can do. But I think just in terms of bandwidth, we, we just can't fit it in this initiative. Yeah, understood. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I do appreciate your comment, and, and we're thinking hard about this problem. We, we want to get it addressed. Okay, uh, Brenda, I think I think possibly yeah. we had one more comment. We do. Mary Washer from Tesla, your line is unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a question for the ISO, uh, mainly, so state, state of energy is a rather limited uh, value to use when dispatching battery systems. Uh, and I was wondering whether the ISO has considered using other telemetry that is already made available by um, by systems to basically decide whether a dispatch should take place or not. So I, I I'm, I'm I'm sorry I I, I was trying to <clears throat> uh, sensing that uh, the line was a little bit co um, not clear to me. So uh, is the question. Uh, do we have telemetry on our SOC? I, I, I didn't hear properly what the question was. Can uh, you repeat not, that question? Yeah, absolutely. So it's not necessarily uh, whether telemetry on SOC is available or not, but there is other telemetry than SOC um, that can be made available from battery systems, namely available power, as an example. Um, and so I was wondering if the ISO is considering using additional telemetry in these, uh, like as part of these enhancements. Uh, to get in a more accurate view of the availability of a given system. Yeah, Mary, I, I think the, the short answer to your question is we're not considering that at this time. Um, if, it, you know, if there's maybe a conversation we need to have about how doing something like that could be valuable, um, you know, I'd be happy to have that conversation. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay. No, thanks for the question. Okay, um, yeah, I, I do think in the interest of time, we should push forward. Um, I, I appreciate the robust discussion, and I also appreciate the fact that this is new information that we haven't really uh, presented before. So um, I, I think it's good that we're having these discussions, and I think a lot of the things that we're bringing up to, to some extent have been topics that we've touched on before, uh, but I think you know, the ISO is still learning. I think market participants are, are engaging more and, and we're starting to hear and receive more clarity on some of these issues. So I do think that this discussion is worthwhile. Um, so, so I appreciate everybody uh, joining in in this uh, conversation. So let's get into the proposal here. So this is the meat of the discussion for today. Oh, I can turn on my camera. Let me see if I can get this going here. It's... Okay. So um, this is the meat of the discussion today, and essentially um, we are uh, continuing to make proposals in the ancillary service space. Specifically, um, we are, you know, we, we know that we're having issues um, when we do have storage resources awarded for ancillary services. Um, there are times when they are not delivering energy that we think that that we think they should be. Um, I, you know, we just had a really great conversation about some of the reasons that that might be uh, contributing to that. Um, two potential ideas that we've had and that we've been thinking very seriously about are, first of all, ensuring that um, our markets are accounting for state of charge when resources are awarded regulation up and regulation down. Um, this is an oversight uh, that's been in our market since we developed 
the initial model for non generator resources and, and the, the storage resources specifically. Um, basically, the way that state, the state of charge equation is updated only depends on energy awards um, and doesn't have any impact from uh, state of charge. The other thing that we've been thinking a lot about, and uh, we had a proposal in our first revised draft proposal, and we've been discussing, um, I, I think since early on in this process, is something in real time that sort of requests that storage resources not be fully encumbered by answer service awards. So, for example, you know, a plus or minus 100 megawatt storage resource could potentially receive uh, 100 megawatts of regulation up and 100 megawatts of regulation down. And once that resource has, has either reached full state of charge or minimum state of charge or potentially some uh, you know, midway threshold point, they may be unable or unwilling to provide uh, regulating services in one direction or the other after that point, which of course could lead to deviations. And one of the ideas that the ISO has had to help try to address that is to require energy bids to accompany um, answer service bids, which means that there would be some portion of the resource that would be unencumbered um, and, and, would, and the market, uh, the five minute RTD market would be able to dispatch. Um, yeah. So those are the two proposals that are included in, in this initiative. Oh, sorry, um, I think we are one slide behind here. So if we could advance, I, I think twice at this point. Um, so I, I apologize, I was not, not looking at, at the right deck there. Um, so this is a formulation that we have today of the state of charge. So basically what it says is that the state of charge for a particular resource I at a particular time T is based on that same resources state of charge in the previous interval. And it's impacted by two different things. It's impacted by the dispatch instructions to discharge and it's um, impacted by the dispatch instructions to charge. So the, the P with the, the positive sign and the P with the negative sign, um, obviously when the resource is charging, uh, there's some round trip efficiencies. So, you know, a battery that charges 10 megawatt hours may only be able to uh, generate 8.5, for example, megawatt hours at a later point in time. So that's that ADA term that would be specific to a particular resource. The ISO is proposing to expand this formulation. Uh, we're not uh, completely reinventing the wheel here. We're adding two additional terms. Um, so we're still gonna have energy awards for discharging energy and energy awards for charging energy. Uh, but in addition to that, we're also going to have uh, regulation up awards or RU and regulation down awards, RD. Um, and those two components of the state of charge formula would have a value mu, uh, mu one and mu two respectively attached to those figures. And those are essentially just multipliers. Um, so we've gone through, and I included this data in an appendix in the second revised straw proposal. And essentially what that appendix outlines is that typically if a resource receives, you know, for example, a 100 megawatt award for regulation up, on average, that resource um, would, would discharge by about eight megawatt hours uh, per hour that it receives that award. Um, for regulation down, the numbers are a little bit higher, um, which I thought was a little bit interesting. But essentially, if a resource receives that same 100 megawatt award for regulation down, on average, we would typically expect that um, the resource would charge by about 19 megawatt hours. Um, so, you know, obviously, I think what this data clearly shows and you know, what we've been talking about is that regulation up and regulation down awards don't necessarily have a specific deterministic impact on what state of charge is gonna be, but we can estimate on average what we think those impacts are gonna be. And on average, it, it's typically about 8% for reg up and, and about 19% of the award for reg down. And we should start, the ISO proposal is, to start including those um, multipliers and, and regulation awards in the calculations for state of charge for, for storage resources. Um, the other thing that I would just note, and, you know, we've had a, a fair bit of discussion about this internally, is that um, 
awards for regulation impact state of charge differently for different times of the day. Um, typically on times of the day when conditions are a little bit more stable and you don't see you know, as much need for ancillary services, you don't see as much drain on state of charge when storage resources are awarded ancillary services. Um, so there could be a potential expansion to this formula where instead of looking at you know, an average across all hours, um, you might specifically say, well, if this is a regulation award in hour ending 18, when things are pretty volatile, maybe your uh, mu values are a little bit higher. If this is an answer service award in hour ending, I don't know, say say 10, uh, when, when things are pretty stable on the system or hour ending 11, um, maybe the mu values are a little bit lower. Um, and I, I think you'd see, and, and I showed some of this data in the appendix of the paper, um, that those new vari variables could vary. So I think that's one of the things that we're looking for feedback on. Is it easier just to set these things at an average and, and leave them alone so people know what the expectations are? Um, or is it a little bit better to get more granular and, and try to drill in to, to what the expectations really are um, closer to an hour by hour um, um, uh, interval? The other, the other thing uh, that's interesting about this Data, well, yeah, so so I, I think that's where our proposal is on um, the, the state of charge formulation. The second proposal is on the next slide, please, um, where we are still talking about state of charge. Last time in the first revised draft proposal when we were talking about this, we said that if a storage resource was awarded, you know, just, just for example, 10 megawatts of regulation up, we would require that that resource have uh, 10 megawatts of uh, bidding range in the downward direction um, that would give the ISO energy market an ability to dispatch the resource to charge um, if state of charge were getting you know, particularly close to uh, the, the lower threshold of the operation limits of that resource. Um, similarly, I think we, we've, we've taken a look at that and, and in light of the data that we saw on the previous slide and what I presented in the straw proposal, um, you know, maybe it's not necessarily the case that it, you know, a, a 10 megawatt award necessarily needs 10 megawatts of energy in the downward direction uh, for bidding capability. Maybe something like five megawatts uh, might be a little bit more appropriate. So we've actually reduced the requirements uh, from 100% of the regulation award to 50% of the regulation award. Um, and, and again, I think we want to get feedback on where where parties stand on, on this being a potential uh, proposal. So just, just to very quickly go through a, a couple of examples, let's suppose you've got a plus or minus 12 megawatt storage resource. Um, so the lower operating range is uh, 12 megawatts of charge, upper operating range is 12 megawatts of discharge. Um, this resource could qualify for a full 12 megawatts of regulation up. At the same time, there would be a requirement for that resource to bid in at least from zero megawatts to minus six megawatts in terms of energy. Um, so, so that again, the ISO has a little bit of ability to uh, charge the resource if it becomes fully discharged because it's basically eaten into uh, that regulation award. Um, same thing for regulation down, you get a 12 megawatt award for regulation down. The requirement that you would be that you would have to bid in um, from zero megawatts to positive six megawatts, at least you could bid in more if you wanted to, um, to ensure that you, there's a little bit of ability for the resource to discharge energy if, if it becomes fully charged, because it's, again, responding to those AGC instructions from regulation down. Um, and then I, I think just to follow this thing through to full conclusion, this particular plus or minus 12 megawatt resource would have the ability um, to, to potentially re receive up to eight megawatts of regulation up in the same hour that it um, received an award for eight megawatts of regulation down. Uh, however, there must that you know that must be accompanied by bids in the downward direction of at least four megawatts of charging capacity and bids in the upward direction of at least four megawatts of uh, discharge capacity. So essentially, you'd have to bid in the full resource um, into the market to ensure that again, if it was um, you know on average receiving instructions, uh, AGC instructions to discharge or AGC instructions to charge that we'd have the ability to issue energy awards to, to charge or discharge the resource. 
So I think that outlines the proposal for ancillary the proposals for ancillary services. Uh, so I can stop here for questions. Okay, um, I do see a couple of callers in the queue. Uh, moving on to our first caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, Gabe. This is Alva from PG&E. Um, I think these are both uh, good heuristic approaches to dealing with the, the KISOs issues. Uh, it should be pointed out that they're both addressing something of the same problem. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be an overlap and it's problematic when you bring in two different solutions to the same problem at the same time. Um, I think even that is you know, tolerable as long as the ISO has sufficient control over the parameters that are involved here. So I, I really would, uh, I, I, I don't believe these should be fixed parameters. In other words, I don't think you should say 50%. I think you should um, design this as flexibly as possible so that potentially you can change it to 25% or 100% or yeah. 0%. It may be hourly varying, um, but it, it's important that it be predictable, that it be understood by participants. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to um, revise these parameters over time. Mm -hmm. And so I really hope that that's the case, both with this, uh, you know, the uh, encumbering of bids and also with the previous one mm -hmm. with the percentages that are used. And again, I, I mean, I, I think one of the consequences of the percentages is it's going to create opportunity costs that don't exist now for participants where they're going to yep. know that a, essentially a portion of their state of charge is being encumbered if they get a, a regulation award that may not actually be used in practice. And so there's an opportunity cost there that, you know, in other words, um, they may have some energy um, that is reserved essentially because of based on this process, and then it doesn't get used or it's not available at a time when they would like to use it. So because these have real um, consequences for the economic behavior of batteries, I think it's really important that the, the numbers be available ahead of time, sufficiently ahead of time that people can bid accordingly, but also that the ISO be able to um, modify them at will based on the uh, yeah. success of them or whether there are new reliability issues that come up. Yeah, um, I, I think that that's a really good point, Alva. And I think with the proposal that we were talking about for um, the formulation for state of charge, the, the analysis that we've done to this point is, is I, I would categorized certainly as preliminary. Um, that's what we found looking at three months worth of data in the spring. So it, it's basically a re recent three month panel um, and we pulled every single storage resource that's received any ancillary services awards, reg up or reg down during that time. And we've analyzed what the impact of state of charge is on those resources. Obviously the makeup of our um, you know, storage fleet is changing. Uh, we're seeing more resources uh, integrate onto the grid. Um, system conditions change season to season. Um, with the data shows that's, that <laughs> this relationship changes hour to hour. Um, and, and I think what you're asking for is exactly what we would intend to do with this formulation. And specifically, um, I, I think what would likely happen is that these mu values would be something that would be uh, specified in a business practice manual. And as we get more experience, as time goes by, as, as system conditions change, as seasons change potentially, um, we might have specified, hey, this is how we intend to change these values. And of course, you know, if we do more analysis and we find that um, resources you know, are discharging more than we initially thought or less than we initially thought, um, we, we'd update those values and, and sort of have a process for refreshing that. Um, I, I agree with you, we, we did not form, formally include that in uh, the proposal, but I, th I think that's, as we move into the draft final proposal, that, that, that is additional detail that I'd like to include. And certainly um, when we start talking about implementation details, that would be a topic that we touch on. Um, you know, how do we keep these, the, this information as fresh as possible? With, you know, I, I think your comment on the second proposal is also valid. Um, I think, you know, what we've seen from the data is, you know, if, if you get a 10 megawatt award for reg, you certainly don't need to have 10 megawatts of bid 
in order to ensure that you have state of charge to be able to provide that regulation. Um, I, I think it's a little bit trickier because instead of wanting sort of an average to capture essentially what you would expect um, the resource to be charged or discharged by from a regulation award, you really want kind of an upper bound or an upper right, limit. Uh, yeah. And maybe it's a 95% or something like that. Uh, but I think we need to think hard about how we would want to set that. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, maybe this is something that you could provide some uh, feedback on, but um, we, I, I think we might be a little bit concerned if, if this target were constantly fluctuating, you know, if it was 45 one month and then 55 the next month and then 30 the next month, um, that might be hard for market participants to kind of rationalize and keep up with. Um, but at the same time, I, I totally agree with you. We don't want these to be overly burdensome, but at the same time, you know, the ISO want, wants to get performance out of these resources, and this is one of the ways we think we can do it. I mean, I, I don't think it's that big of a, a burden because basically, you know, if, if resources are basically having to bid their full range, you know, you're kind of in the worst case, then the ISO doesn't have to use mm -hmm. that. They can they can award more or less depending on what is actually um, operationally required. Um, but the you know just to point if if the first half of this were implemented perfectly, which it won't be of course, but if it were implemented perfectly, you would have already guaranteed that no resource was going to hit its bounds. And so in that case, you should be awarding maximum regulation mm -hmm. of all the resources because you you've already captured by by you're you're going to constrain the awards based on the state of charge rather than on this on this basis so it's it, they're get, these two things are going to interact and um if you're right now this second part may be a great solution given that you haven't done the first part but if uh if you do the first part it's yeah. going to be a uh, overkill i think so okay yeah um we, we've had similar conversations internally, um, and, and we are thinking hard about that. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to, to have those discussions. Thank you. No, th thanks for the comments, Alva. I appreciate them. Okay, I do see a um, couple more callers in the queue. Moving on to the next caller. Please go ahead, a line is unmuted. Yes, Sorry, Sherry Shriya. Bente, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Sorry, this is Carrie Bentley. Are you unmuting me? I don't have my hand raised. We can hear you, Carrie. Oh, I, I don't yes. have my hand raised. Yes. I commented on the chat. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I saw your hand raised on my end. Now mine. Um, moving on to the next caller. Please go ahead, a line is unmuted. Uh, good morning, this is uh, Sergio Lenez with CISA. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Sergio, you're a little faint, uh, so if you could bring the mic closer if possible. Let's see if I can do that. Is this better? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, I really wanted to echo a lot of what Alba just said. Um, I think from our perspective, uh, definitely these two options seem to get a part of the issue that the ISO wants to fix. It is unclear from the second straw proposal how, how these two uh, would operate together or if one of them would offer, you know, more of a, a quick fix while the other goes more to the point of what is the issue. We believe that the first option of the uh, state of charge formulation, um, you know, that offers much more clarity, uh, but perhaps the, the way that the new values are getting derived now, you, you said that they change, this relationship changes hour to hour. Uh, would it be, how burdensome would it be for staff to try to further develop that idea in like a, a table of hourly new values rather than having both of these solutions that, as Ava said, I really think uh, the second one could be overkill, you know, if we have the first one, since in the end, uh, it might 
really restrain, you know, constrain the amount of regulation that storage can provide. Uh, and and that could, you know, have its own set of adverse effects as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, would it be complex, like overly complex to have like just maybe not even hourly values, but like by periods of the day, if you even mm-hmm. see that or, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, Sergio, um, so I, I th- thanks for the comments. Um, in the second revised draw proposal, the paper, I did include a full table of what those mu values would look like, um, mu1 and mu2, on an hourly basis, if, if you broke down the three months worth of data that we looked at. and. Um, talking to technology and the teams that would actually be implementing this, um, they said because time is already an element in the state of charge equation, it wouldn't be terribly difficult, you know, technologically to update the function to, to vary on an hour by hour. So I, I think, you know, mm-hmm. kind of what I'm hearing from this conversation is it sounds like market participants might like that. Um, so that might be something, you know, as we move forward with this, uh, th- that we do include in the proposal going forward, because I think it is possible on our end. Yeah, the only the only concern I would have there, but honestly, it's the same concern with the second option, is that you might see variation as time as time mm-hmm. uh, you know goes on. You might see that uh, if this values mu values are cal- calculated on a rolling average of the last three or six months of operation, Mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, there might need to be a way of updating constantly uh, market participants, and that would affect their own bidding strategies. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how stable those values are. That might be some data that uh, could be beneficial, you know, for stakeholders to better understand. I believe you said you looked at the last three months of of data? Essentially, yeah. So, uh, I mean, if we looked a year ago, we have a way a different storage situation, right? But that really is what's uh, going to happen yeah. in the next two years. We'll never have uh, a similar grid for more than 12 months, likely, So we, because of so much storage is going in. Mm-hmm. So maybe, you know, having that type of rolling data and, like, a, a way of uh, posting it and, and advising people on how it's being reformed uh, and updated would be very useful, but thanks, Gabe. Yeah, and I, and I think, um, you know, similar to the comments that I made uh, in response to Alva's questions, I, I think the ISO would be willing to do something like that. And, and we certainly wouldn't want to, you know, do some analysis based on just a handful of months and say, yep, these are the numbers, we're never gonna change them. I think it'd be much more appropriate to look at seasonality, um, look, look at potentially hourly data, and, and see how things vary from there. Uh, and, and again, likely this would be something that the ISO could potentially maintain in a business practice manual um, and have, have just a, a, a regular routine process for refreshing this information. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, considering that. Yeah, thanks for the comments, Sergio. I appreciate it. Uh, so, Brenda, I think you've noted that we've got a couple questions in the chat. Uh, do, do you want to just read that? I'm having difficulty seeing everything that's coming up in the chat. Yeah, that's fine. Michael Volk from PG&E. On this previous slide, the charge instruction P plus values expected to be negative. If not, I would expect the sign to be flipped to negative, similar to how you stated in the write down term. Both of these terms add to state of charge. Yes. Um, uh, it, it, the, we, the, the math is done in such a way that the signs work out. Um, so if I'm looking at the right slide here, which I'm not, let me pull this up. Um, so when you're, uh, you, you've got an energy award that is detracting from state of charge. Uh, so so the, the P with the positive sign is a positive value. Um, the P with a negative sign is a negative value, and that's when you've got. And I and I think there's the, the way we've written it out like this is in the actual code. Um, there's an additional multiplier that's included um, where you're you're multiplying by essentially one or zero, and you multiply by one if it's positive, and and that gets you the, the P positive values, and you're multiplying by one 
if if the value is less than zero um, to get the p negative values. So I, I think that's where they're coming from. But this, this, the signs are set up in such a way um, so that the, the math works out correctly. Um, it, I, I think for the second equation, the idea would be that the reg up awards and the reg down awards would always be positive values, whereas the energy award, the p value could either be positive or negative, and that's why you see a negative sign affixed to the reg down, and you don't see a negative sign to the p with, with the minus sign. Okay. Carrie Bentley from WPTF asked, can you confirm the mean of real-time energy bid only? Because the SC would like to know the day ahead AS award prior to bidding. And then second, can you confirm the proposal would be for all resources, not just storage, just provide to provide energy bid? Yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, the, the requirement here is that you know, a storage resource that gets awarded regulation up would be required to bid into their charging range. Um, I think I think this rule would apply for all resources that have a, a charging range. Um, and can you give me the the? Yeah, I, I agree with you that. I, I think the rule would actually be applied in the day ahead market and the real time market because in the day ahead market, you, you know, you you bid in your energy awards, your, your energy um, curves, and you bid in your regulation, and the market could potentially pick you up for reg up, it could potentially pick you up for energy, it could particularly potentially pick you up for reg down. Um, but what we're saying is, if it did pick you up for reg up, it would only do that as long as you had some energy bids in the downward direction. If you didn't provide any energy bids to charge, you wouldn't receive any any bids for reg up. Uh, but but this would all be done in the co-optimization and day ad market. Uh, but then yes, you're right. After the day ad market runs, there would be um, a requirement in the real time. You know, if, if you do have a regulation up award to at least have some bids in the downward direction, and, and currently we're proposing 50% of, of the award for reg. So hopefully that helps. And we do have a raise hand from Raul. Um, we could go ahead and unmute Raul from AES. Oh, Gabe, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Yes. Okay, so I think when I raised my hand, uh, I was going to ask you, and you answered that question that this change would be applied to both day ahead and real time. And I'm assuming 15 and five minute, 15 minute and day ahead, and not the five minute, right? Or in five minute also. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, your your bids in the real time market are submitted um, prior to the start of the hour. So whatever bids you made, it would be effective for both the RTPD and the RTD markets. You know, but I, here the state of charge equation change is for both day ahead and real time. Yeah, correct. So, and this would go into the optimization decision whether you get an award or not. Correct. Based on your energy offers across it across the two intervals correct okay and the other portion portion of soc when it is reserved for flex uh, or the minimum soc that is reserved for spinning reserve that that piece would still stay the same for soc right this is just showing the change this is not showing that those those details would be those details would not be removed that's that's exactly correct yep Okay, thank you. Yep, thanks, thanks for the questions, Rahul. I appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Um, yes, Martin Schaun and, uh, would like to ask, the P plus is a discharging schedule in the market of the BPM, and the P minus is a charging, which is why it gets mul multiplied by ETA. So that's what he mentioned in his comment. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. That's exactly right. Th thanks for that clarification, Martin. Yeah, and then Mary Washer from Tesla said, how is the multiplier determined? Um, so I 
think we're talking about this slide, um, the multiplier mu1 and mu2. Uh, I, I don't think we've outlined a specific methodology for determining them, um, but basically what I did to come up with this 0 0.08 and 0 0.19 values uh, was to look at, you know, basically what we did is pull three months worth of data for all the storage resources in the fleet. And anytime those resources received a regulation up award or a regulation down award, we actually went into the data and, and stripped out any changes to state of charge that would be related to energy awards and looked at what the change of state of charge was, you know, over a particular hour for that resource. Um, then with all the data for uh, reg up awards, reg down awards and changes in state of charge, I just did, you know, a, a sim simple regression and um, used as my explanatory value uh, variables, um, regulation up and regulation down to explain the, the changes in state of charge for any particular hour. And um, the multipliers associated with those explanatory values were the, the 0.8 and the 0.19. Um, I think this is a, you know, probably a good first uh, a step in estimating what, what these values should be. Um, it might not be uh, the, the final way we actually choose to implement this. And like I said, I think what's really important in this proposal is that actual formulation would include two multipliers. I think the values of the multipliers would be something that would be maintained and specified specifically in the business practice manuals. And, you know, again, likely um, if, if there were a, a more reasonable approach on how we should be updating those values um, and as time goes by and the values actually change uh, because uh, grid conditions change or as seasons change or something like that, um, I, th I think, you know, the, the ISO would, uh, similar to other values that we maintain in, in business practice manuals, we, we'd go through a process to update and refresh uh, that information. But really good question. We have Carrie Bentley, lastly, on the raised hand, so let's go ahead and unmute. Sure. Hi, Dave. Carrie Bentley with Western Power Trading Forum. Sorry, my question, I think, got a little bit lost in translation, so I was going to try again. Oh, I um, no, no. Um, so when you're talking about, um, you know, the rule in the paper and the presentation says that you're proposing to have an AS award that accompanies energy bids, but in the day ahead, you don't know the award ahead of time. So I just want to make it really clear, your rule really is different. It's, at least as I understood your answer, it's that in order to be awarded regulation, you have to provide an energy bid for your full regulation bid, or you won't even be considered for it. Yeah, for 50% of the regulation bid, yeah. Yeah, but it has to be, but it's not for the award, it's for the full offer. Otherwise, that offer, I guess you're saying, won't even be considered in, as a valid offer in the market? So if I, you know, if, if I bid in, you know, I'm a, I'm a plus or minus 100 megawatt resource, and I only bid in 10 megawatts of charging capability for, for, for energy bids, and I didn't bid anything in below minus 10. You know, I, for whatever reason, I don't know why, um, for a specific hour in the day ahead market. During that particular hour, the resource couldn't receive more than a 20 megawatt award for reg up. Um, another hour where you bid more, you know, 50 megawatts okay. or more, you could get the full award. And it's, everything's still co-optimized, um, and, and it's all, you know, optimally determined by uh, the market. Yeah. Um, have you considered that an implication then of that day ahead rule um, is that um, a resource that wants to be awarded regulation today won't even provide an energy bid. They'll just provide a reg bid um, and that's fine. But in the future, because it's co-optimized and because therefore they could just be taken for energy and not reg, they're going to end up bidding a really high price most likely to. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. And the Department of Market Monitoring has reviewed that and is going to be really clear about what that means in terms of gaming and, and that sort of thing? Um, we, we have had conversations with the Department of Market Monitoring, um, so they have been included in these discussions. I think, um, I, I think there's probably more to unfold in, in that area. 
Okay. It would be really helpful if we got clear guidance from them on this, because I can imagine, you know, it's three years from now, it's being implemented and I'm telling someone, Hey, you just have to bid really high. And they're going to say, no, that's I'm yeah. So I maybe just consider that a little yeah. bit more. No, yeah. I, I am, I am very aware of, of those concerns. I, I think that's, that's valid feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Okay, great. Um, and then um, I missed your answer. I was having some connection issues, I think, on um, you're going to require this for all resources, not just storage. Yeah, I mean, um, so storage resources are really the ones with the, the charging capabilities and the discharging capabilities. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, I might be answering too quickly here, but I think this would apply for any resources that would, would have positive ranges of bids and negative ranges of bids. Obviously a gas resource only has has, has positive bid ranges. Um, so it wouldn't apply to them. Mm, I think in in my um, kind of understanding of no pay and AS world, there's actually lots of constraints that could prevent you from providing your AS. Um, and to say that the state of charge is mm -hmm. the only physical constraint that we're going to force some sort of uneconomic buyback on, mm -hmm. not all these other constraints that do lead to no pay, I think you really are opening yourself up to a discriminatory argument. Um, and frankly, one that uh, WPTF may make at FERC. It I, we'd have to really look at whether this is now unfairly um, discriminating against storage. Um, and I, you know, I, I can't say what we would do at this point in time, sure. but I think it's something that you guys before going to FERC should really look into and be able to say, hey, the only other resources that really have these constraints um, don't normally bid into regulation or it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really get nervous um, when something is applied to a specific resource type. And I would hate for this whole initiative to be derailed by a discriminatory issue. Sure. Yep. Yep. Thanks, no, Gabe. I those comments. Thank, thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that. We do have a few, two more people that just jumped online to raise your hand. Would you like to take? Let's go one? ahead, them. And I, I just ask that um, let, let, I'll, I'll try to keep my responses brief, and I'd ask that comments are brief at this point as well, too, so we can move on and get through the rest of the material. Okay, Eli Guilinbaum. You're next. Please state your company that you work for, too. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Eli Gilfenbaum from Tesla. So I just had a question on the optimization formulation for this. When uh, regulation of bids are being co-optimized, including this energy bid, does the optimization assume that the full 50% megawatt capacity associated with that energy required energy bid clears and that's essentially part of the regulation bid or is the optimiz I guess I'm looking for more clarity on how that co-optimization is defined in determining whether a regulation bid would clear based on the corresponding energy award that's yeah. associated with it. The, the requirement bid. would just be that the bid be there um, and it would be irrelevant whether or not the bid cleared or not or partially cleared. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Lastly, we have Alva from pg and &E. Let's go ahead and take your Hi, uh, Alva from pg and &E. This is just to join in on the first part of Carrie's comment, not on the second part, but I think mm -hmm. given that SPIN currently does not require an energy bid um, to a company in, in day ahead, I don't mm -hmm. see any reason that you actually should have an energy bid requirement day ahead. You should simply have the ability to not award fully the regulation on the basis that you will have a, a must offer requirement in the yeah. other direction, essentially, if you're, so if you're, if you were uh, to uh, essentially award full reg up, then you would have a must offer and must bid requirement in real time. And the reason for that is because exactly the point that Kerry raised, that energy should not be available for the energy market. It is, sim it is meant to support the regulation. And so it should simply be, uh, an unused portion of the of the, of the range of the resource. And I think that mm -hmm. also addresses the Tesla question because I don't think that energy should be part of the optimization except as a constraint. That's mm -hmm. just my comment on that. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think the point's well taken. Uh, we'll consider to think about that. I, I think the concern is that 
it's it's not if you necessarily receive uh, an award for 100 megawatts of reg up in the day ahead market and, and nothing happens on the, on the charging side and you never got a, a bid to charge and, and there was no, never anything else. I think the concern is if, you rec- if you're a plus or minus 100 megawatt resource and you receive 100 megawatts of reg up and 100 megawatts of reg down, then you're in a situation where both that's why you don't. That's why you don't award 100 megawatts of reg up and reg down. You award if it's if it's 75 or um, I, I can't do the math, but I think it's probably like 66 in both directions right. in that case. And that's something that you can do within the based on the on the on that rule without having to have an energy bill present. So the requirement would just be that you you know in the day ahead market you could only receive. Um, you know, awards that could be supported by an energy bid. By it, that could be supported. And then if you are awarded that regulation, it, the, the bidding uh, requirement right. at the time is that you're there. Okay. That's right. Yeah, right well, bid, bid insertion potentially, if, if, uh, okay. which is what happens with SPIN. Okay. Let me, I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, let me let me take that back and think about it a little bit. But, um, you know, on the face of it, I, I think that's pretty reasonable. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments, Brenda? No, we're good. So let's get going here. Um, uh, so we're, we're at 11 o'clock, just, or well, we're at 10 to 11 right now, um, just to do a little time check. Um, we do have more of the presentation to go. Um, we have the other two reliability issues and the co-located issue. I am anticipate, oh, I did anticipate that the answer service topic would sort of be the, the bulk of the discussion today. Um, I'm happy to continue to have the discussion. Um, uh, j- just to set expectations, though, uh, we, we still do have a fair amount to run through in uh, just over an hour. So let's dive into it. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the ISO is proposing um, internal tools to ensure local reliability. Um, most of what we have in this section is unchanged from the previous proposal, although I did include just a, a very, very simple example on the next slide. Um, you know, the, the ISO does already perform studies on how storage resources could potentially be used in local areas, um, and, and these are planning studies, um, to meet reliability needs in those areas. Um, and, and we know that there's a certain amount of uh, you know, four hour duration batteries that you could potentially have in a local area and what those four hour batteries could potentially allow you to retire or what else you may need to procure um, you know, paired with a certain amount of store, uh, storage resources in order to continue to maintain uh, reliability in those local areas. Um, in those reports, we are specifying, I think, upper thresholds on total amount of four hour storage capacity that could be located in, in a local area, um, given what requirements are, total requirements, and essentially what this outlines is the proportion of total amount of resources that could be four hour duration storage. Um, we are looking at uh, requirements for charging energy. Um, so not only do you have enough energy to serve your load over those tight conditions in the local areas? But do you have the capability under those stressed conditions to bring in enough charge to be able to charge your batteries so that they can be used um, during the later periods when you need them for meeting uh, reliability concerns? So that is an aspect of the study that the ISO is doing. Um, the operations time frame also ensures that the ISO um, could potentially uh, use gas resources. Um, so now switching from the planning time frame to the actual operational time frame, um, you know, our operators and the tools that our operators have can make trade-offs between, you know, hey, we need to commit a gas resource in a couple hours to make sure we have um, sufficient energy or uh, capability to generate energy in the event a contingency happens. Same thing, you know, we may need to start charging storage resource in a couple hours to make sure that it has enough state of charge to ensure um, that it can meet needs um, d- during peak intervals if a contingency were to occur. Um, 
and 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 you know our operations team recognizes that um, storage resources are you know, just as capable of providing energy as long as they're charged as um, gas resources are. So the proposal here is that the ISO is going to enhance its internal tools so that the the trade-offs between you know either procuring storage resources for these local contingencies or potentially um, starting gas resources and having them sit at min load on the re on the uh, grid are available and um, weighing those trade-offs and then uh, efficiently making the decision for the market which which one should occur and, and pricing um, I, either of those contingencies into the market. So on the next slide, I've, I've just outlined, and again, this is a very, very simple illustration of how this might potentially work. So let's suppose you're looking at one potential local area. Um, let's suppose you're thinking about hours you know, 17, 18, 19, and you've got a local need. You know, it's very, very plain, very easy, um, you know, 50 megawatts during each of those hours. So you need 50 megawatts an hour ending 17, 50 megawatts an hour ending 18, 50 megawatts an hour ending 19. If this uh, potential contingency in a local area occurs, um, the rest of the day, you suspect that even with the contingency in place, um, you'd still be able to get plenty of energy or enough sufficient energy to be able to operate uh, the local area. So you basically need um, th th that 50 megawatts over all three hours. So obviously, one potential solution would be you commit a gas resource um, that has at least 50 megawatts of capacity. Um, that gas resource is available uh, from hours ending 17 to 19. Obviously, uh, that will come with costs, the co cost associated with actually starting the resource and the cost with, you know, if it's not scheduled for energy, potentially having it sit at min load um, during those that three hour stretch. Um, of course, potentially, Prices could be high, um, and if those high prices materialize, um, you know you're, you're not paying. You, you know there, there's no need to uplift the min load cost. Um, the the trade off could potentially be well, you've got a 50 megawatt gas resource sitting there, or you potentially have a 50 megawatt four hour battery sitting in that local area. Um, of course, it, it, things are a little bit different now. Instead of uh, requiring the battery to start no startup associated with the storage resources. You would instead need the battery to hold state of charge and you need it to be at least at 150 megawatt hours by hour ending 17. Similar to the gas resource, prices could materialize in hour ending 17, 18, 19, um, such that the resource is discharged, at least discharged up to 50 megawatts if it's sitting at right at 150 going into hour ending 17. Um, but other, otherwise, you know, it might just sit through the, those hours and hold state of charge. And the idea would be um, that the tools, you know, as we enhance them, would weigh these two different uh, considerations for this one particular local area and would pick uh, the most cost effective one um, to provide these services and ensure that we have uh, reliability in this local area. So um, I'll pause here for any questions on the local proposal. We do have a question from Perry. Let's Great. go ahead and. Hey, this is Perry Servideo, GDS Associates. Thanks for providing the example, Gabe. I had a couple um, clarifying questions and, and concerns, but I think my most, most of my concerns are just in the lack of documentation. It's kind of the, where my questions are coming from too. Um, in this example, if you needed the storage resource in this local area, you have the mock constraint there. Um, would the constraint result in needing to charge the resource prior to hour 17? Yeah, I, I think it, there's a potential that it could. Okay, so it'll be a constraint in the market that will change energy schedules on resources. Yes, it could, yeah. Okay, and then is is that constraint, will that, now the mock is currently not priced in the market. Are you saying now that when the mock's binding, that price, that shadow price will be reflected in the resource LMPs, everybody's resource LMPs? So, yeah, I, I don't think, um, you know, we, we, we can call it a min minimum online commitment constraint, um, but, we, you know, whatever the constraint is, 
um, would show up in prices, yes. Okay, so if it's binding, it'll change not just the energy storage resource schedules that are in the that are effective on the constraint. It'll have to change everybody's schedules because if you need the resource to charge, some other resource has to be providing the energy, right? It, it could, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then you know this has to do with pricing and whatnot. So our first concern with this is the lack of documentation on the price formation. I mean, we know it's going to affect all market participants and all the LMP prices. Um, and and this is different from the current mock because the current mock only affects commitment, uh, which has very little impact on the marginal clearing prices for energy. Um, the other part of this concern, you know, because this will impact the market clearing prices, um, we really would want to see the transparent constraint formulation uh, in the documentation uh, and the normal details that KISO would usually provide when they're impacting price formation. And we know that the current mock is well documented. I could go out there and find the constraint formulation um, and the gas constraint that you referenced on the previous uh, slide is well documented. We want to see those documentations for, uh, for this constraint also. So I hope that that's forthcoming, um, and then maybe maybe my concerns will be um, um, abated. Uh, our second concern is that in the past, KISO discussed at length how pricing N minus one minus one constraints in the market as N minus one constraints is very costly. And that also makes intuitive sense. Um, they also, you know, you guys also built a prototype that showed that the N minus one minus one constraints when appropriately modeled would rarely bind. Uh, and that indicates that they're rarely ever actually needed. Or said differently, you know, when accounting for actual available capacity through shift factors, there's plenty of 30 minute capacity to resolve the constraints um, most of the time. So this accentuates this cost concern because market prices would incorporate these costs and market clearing prices every day uh, for a constraint that would rarely actually be needed. You're given this, our, I guess our, in short, our comment here is that um, because it would, rare, because KISO has shown that these are rarely ever needed, it seems in this one, due to the potential cost implication, it might just make more sense to use the ED um, that you guys are talking about using, the ED to hold for charge uh, with appropriate compensation there. Um, and that could that could resolve this issue. You could target the resources you wanted in whatever local areas you wanted, et cetera. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of a mouthful, but that's that's where we are on this on this topic. Yeah, th thanks for that feedback, Barry. Um, I, I think part of our reluctance to just say, oh yeah, let, let's just go ahead and have operators exceptionally dispatch this, is that um, you know for situations like this, you know. The operations team is certainly not going to be sitting down and weighing the cost to commit a gas resource or to potentially potentially uneconomically charge a storage resource. Um, and I think that is something that we we may like to capture in terms of um, you know some some kind of optimization so so that we are making the most efficient choices. But, but I do appreciate efficient though is you know what you were showing in the past. I mean, you're describing what you're calling here a second tier constraint, which means you have a time period in which you're allowed to recover. And what you're saying by putting it into a into an n minus one constraint is that you have no time to recover. You actually need to meet the constraint prior to yep. um, any corrective action, and that's very costly. Uh, so it's a cost. It's a cost concern. Again, if I could see the formulations, maybe I might. I might feel differently about this. Okay. okay. Yeah, I appreciate that feedback. Thanks, Perry. Thanks, Gabe. Next, we have Raul. Let's go ahead and mute Raul. Hi, Gabe. Uh, this is Rahul from AES. Uh, so I would like to echo uh, Perry's comments about documentation. And the you know, additional question I have is the way I read it, this is something that would be part of the day ahead market also. Is my assumption correct? Was this be a constraint in the day ahead market? So 
I think the the two sides of the coin, right? First is if I if a resource gets charged uh, for this MOC constraint, then you know it does that cost gets reflected, and I think that would be answered by when you provide the documentation for mm -hmm. the price formation. The second is lost opportunity cost, right? Like you have hour ending 17 through 19 in your example where the resource, you're going to hold the resource to, mm -hmm. and if the price is such that I cannot discharge, mm -hmm. then there's a lost opportunity. And yep. most storage resources are essentially designed with the idea that there is an energy arbitrage opportunities. So mm -hmm. essentially you're looking to charge in low, low hours and then, you know, discharge in the high price hours. So if these are the hours, if I just take this example, that essentially takes that value off the table. Is that something you've already considered? And I don't know if it's there in the next section of how does the storage get compensated for lost opportunity? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. And we have had some uh, discussions internally about that. Um, I think, you know, to, to Perry's previous point, um, you know, in in local areas where you are depending on storage resources during these um, you know, potential times, they don't happen that often. Um, and when you are um, relying on storage resources, oftentimes in the development process, um, the storage resource may have been specifically procured because of these local conditions. And I think in those, and obviously there's other scenarios out there, but I think in those kinds of scenarios where um, storage resources are specifically procured um, to provide these kinds of services in local areas, um, which I, I believe are the cases for, you know, at, at least some of the resource, storage resources that are located in, in local areas where these conditions actually bind today, um, I think we are comfortable with those costs being recovered through some kind of fixed payment uh, that would be agreed on when the resource is initially uh, being contracted for uh, by the entity that's, that's procuring the capacity. And I think at the time, and again, these are the resources that I know of that are located in local areas where these constraints could potentially bind, um, you know, those resources are very aware of those conditions as they're signing contracts. And because of that awareness, I'm sure that, you know, exactly like you're saying, the modeling of uh, expected energy arbitrage has been augmented to reflect periods when they would be needed for local reliability because of you know, potentially holding state of charge. It's is that something that's very well documented? Because I want to make sure those resources who are counting on those opportunities do not mm -hmm. lose out. So if that can be, if you can add those details to the paper or future okay. where these zones have been identified, you don't have to identify the storage resources, but at least say, okay, these zones have been identified and Kaiso intends to use those. So sometimes something, because generally in the development process, you know, yeah. There are, there, is a, there are larger teams that are involved. So not everyone may be aware of this thing is yep. coming down the pipeline. So yep. if you can provide that information, that would be good. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'll, I'll have that conversation internally and see what I can do. But, but thank you for the feedback, Rahul. I appreciate it. Yeah, in general, it doesn't, you know, even if we have this information, this just does not sound the best way to compensate. And I want to hold that right to come back because I want to socialize this discussion with our team. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I would say that, you know, this is something that we would definitely comment on. Okay. Yeah, great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Lastly, we got Marie Washer from Tesla. Let's go ahead and unmute you. Thank you very much. This is, uh, Marie Washer with Tesla. Um, so this example, and at least this is inherent to the SOC formula, but um, it, this still assumes that your resource will be able to dispatch 50 megawatts all the way until the last megawatt hour of its state of charge, um, which is a problem that's been highlighted several times before. I just wanted to emphasize it here. Yep, yep, uh, that, that's absolutely the case. 
Yeah, th thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Yep. Okay, um, why don't we go ahead on to the next section? Um, again, I, you know, I, I, I think we've, we've sort of front loaded some of the more controversial issues. Um, so I, I think, you know, we are, we are gaining a little bit of speed here, which is good. Um, exceptional dispatch, similar to the previous topic, did not change very much um, from our pri uh, previous proposal. I think, you know, like I mentioned, we, we made a, a couple of tweaks to the formulation for how the counterfactuals would work. Um, I did not go through and include slides on the examples um, that were included in the paper and they were included in our presentation and, and the, the first revised draw proposal um, from last time. So um, I, I think this conversation may also be a, a little briefer as well. Um, so uh, this shouldn't be a surprise at this point, uh, but the ISO is planning and proposing to expand exceptional dispatch authority for storage resources. Essentially, the authority would be to uh, effectively tell a storage resource um, to move, uh, to hold at least a certain amount of uh, state of charge, um, and it wouldn't be an energy uh, directive. It would instead be a directive to say, hey, look, we need you to have at least, I don't know, 100 megawatt hours of state of charge from this time to this time instead of a, a typical dispatch, uh, exceptional dispatch instruction, which might be, hey, we need your resource, any resource, to provide a specific amount of, of energy to the grid over some prolonged period of time. Um, yeah, the traditional exceptional dispatch is a megawatt target, not a megawatt hour target. And uh, the, the way the compensation works is the higher of, you know, the prevailing locational marginal price or the bid that that resource is being required to perform at. Um, our operations team may desire to have, uh, you know, ex exceptionally dispatch a storage resource to hold them at a particular state of charge on our very highest, very tightest days. This could be a concern. Uh, we know that we need a certain amount of energy uh, later on the day. The operations team actually has tools that, that can do the calculations for, you know, how, how many number of megawatt hours do I need an hour ending 18, 19, 20? Um, how many megawatt hours am I expecting to get um, if resources were able to perform at their maximum over that course of the hour? And then, how, you know, if, if, if that's the case, how much residual energy megawatt hours do I need from my storage fleet to be able to ensure that the lights stay on during that, that period of time? And what that could potentially mean is that some resources, some storage resources may need to charge up uh, to be able to get to uh, that particular state of charge. Um, the operators also can use just kind of as a rule of thumb, uh, day ahead awards and schedules and, and kind of justify, well, you know, it is a particular storage resource at or below its, its uh, specified state of charge in the day ahead market on these very tight days. Um, and, and that may also influence uh, exceptional dispatches on those resources to ensure that they can meet um, potential needs for later in the day that the operations team may have. Um, the exceptional dispatch, uh, for storage resources to hold state of charge um, would be something that would be implemented and, and there would be, uh, you know, binary instructions that go to the, to the storage resource. Essentially, if you're at or above the state of charge that's required by the ED, um, you know, the instruction would be, hey, hold that state of charge uh, or at, at least hold that state of charge, you could potentially be above it. Um, or if the resource is below the target state of charge, I think the instruction would be for the resource to actually charge. And when the resource is receiving exceptional dispatch instructions to charge, um, that's compensated just the same way as traditional uh, resources are compensated today. Um, and, and the point here is that, you know, if you're in that first bucket where you have the state of charge that's required by the ED, um, instead of, uh, you know, it, instead of being compensated at bid or better, um, you could also be compensated for uh, lost opportunities because you know, if, if you're um, not discharging and, and you're right at that threshold, 
you know, the ISO could effectively be preventing you from, from participating in the real-time market when you would have liked to. So the idea here is that, um, and, and this is outlined on the next slide, please. Um, you know, yeah, that we'd run two very simplified counterfactuals. We'd basically look at, you know, what a profit maximizing energy schedule profile would be with the EDs and what the profit maximizing energy schedule profile would look like um, without the exceptional dispatches. And we just compared the two. Um, the counterfactuals would be based on the actual realized prices. So we're just looking at LMPs um, at that resources location. And um, instead of looking at the uh, counterfactuals for just the length of duration of the battery, so if you've got a four hour battery, we were initially proposing to only look at four hours immediately following the exceptional dispatch, including the time of the exceptional dispatch. Um, we'd look at all the intervals through the end of the day. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this helps us in terms of settlements because we're only looking at uh, one day worth of data um, and, and not like sort of spilling over into the second day. Um, but, but we also feel like that this kind of makes sense because you may be wanting to discharge towards the end of the day. If there's better opportunities to discharge during the end of the day um, and you were holding state of charge earlier, uh, maybe that wouldn't have gotten captured in uh, the original counterfactuals that we proposed last time. Um, and again, I think these two changes that we made uh, were in response to stakeholder feedback that we received. And um, I, I, I think that both of these changes improve uh, the calculations uh, that we're making um, uh, in, in terms of how these resources would be compensated for this exceptional dispatch. So I can pause here, Brenda, uh, to see if there's anybody on the phone or any uh, comments through the chat. There were no comments through the chat at this time and Raise hands are currently not showing up right now, so. Okay. We can certainly circle back, uh, but again, this is something that we, I know we've talked a lot about, so we, we just may not need the discussion at this point. But let's go ahead into the co-located elements of the paper. Um, and I, again, I would emphasize this by far was the area where we have seen the most stakeholder feedback. Um, you know, it was obvious that the kinds of you know, checks that we wanted to put in place of who could use these uh, improved co-located models was not something that was palatable to, <laughs> and, and, and this was kind of incredible. It, it was nearly everybody who submitted comments had comments on this. Um, so it was kind of like Groundhog Day, uh, reading, reading the comments, every, com every set of comments said, no, you should just eliminate these restrictions. Um, so I, I've had some long, you know, fairly uh, uh, challenging in-depth conversations with our, you know, operations team, both at, at the ground level, people who are working on the floor day to day, and with operations management about their comfort level for this. And I do think, you know, a after, you know, having these conversations, I do think the comfort level has improved. Um, and, and I think we're basically at a point and, and Brenda, you can move on to the next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, but, but I think we're basically at a point where we are okay with dropping the requirements to be able to have, uh, you know, participate with a model that would essentially um, not grid charge co-located resources. Um, I, I do think, and I think this is true of, of all policy the ISO develops, but I think this is a, this is a caveat here on this particular policy. You know, the ISO may choose to re revisit this in the future if, if we do move forward and, and implement something like this. Um, if we see that every single storage resource on the grid um, has these kinds of limitations, which I, I think at this point is not what we expect, but it could potentially happen as, as we're opening the door for it. Um, and we see that, you know, there are times when you know, we, gee, we really do need to charge these storage resources when solar is not available potentially. Um, you know, we, we may kind of circle back and, and potentially put some limits on this. But at this point, um, and, and again, my expectations would be um, that we develop these rules. And I think uh, things, you know, e even, even the way that they're outlined right now, I, I think things will be 
fine, and, and some resources will opt into this, uh, and these would be the resources that need these sort of allowances, and other resources won't opt into this. Um, and, and, I, and I think uh, overall, this isn't going to threaten grid reliability, um, but, but the caveat's out there. We, you know, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in these meetings talking about investment tax credits. I think we've heard a lot from the stakeholder community about, um, you know, incentives and how these incentives impact contracts that are formed between developers and counterparties. Um, we also know that property taxes are a real issue and property taxes sometimes are heavily dependent on uh, grid charging or not. And, it, and it's really imperative uh, for these resources in terms of revenue streams to have the ability to not grid charge or effectively not have energy flowing from the grid into the project um, if it's a you know, solar plus storage or other renewable plus storage project. Um, we know, and, and these are things we've all been over, but um, contracts are restricting operations from resources. Um, and you know, that is a concern for the ISO because we're, uh, we have limited ability to operate our grid um, from a market perspective that could lead to inefficient uh, market results. But at the same time, we understand that you know, a lot of these contracts were put into place many years ago before we even had a model for storage resources potentially, certainly before you know, some of these contracts were struck before we had a model for co-located or hybrid resources. Um, so they were struck at a time when you know, th there was a lot of uncertainty about how these were actually gonna be treated in the market and we didn't have any storage resources in the market. So there was no knowledge there. So we, we do appreciate that and we appreciate um, that at the same time, the ISO, the CPUC, the state, we're making loud calls for more capacity to join the system. And, and we appreciate and applaud the efforts that our participants have, have gone through um, in, in some really challenging times, frankly, um, to get these resources integrated and implemented and up and running in what's largely a very positive manner um, on our grid. And, and just kind of frame this in, in terms of the whole conversation we're having. Um, you know, I, I see these as relatively small improvements uh, to, to make operations a little bit easier for the ISO. And hopefully um, this change, which is gonna make uh, uh, development and implementation easier for uh, new storage resources coming on the grid and storage resources that are already on the grid. Um, but at the same time, we've got a, a really great fleet of storage resources that are actually helping and making meaningful impacts on uh, reliability. So I, I think, I think there's a lot of uh, positive th that that's happening um, in the last few years. Um, th these are just some incremental improvements we can make to our models. Um, yeah, so uh, those are the ISO's concerns. Um, I, I think they've been well documented. I think we've had the, the conversations, um, and, and I and I think we do do recognize that you know these these new resources really probably could use some new accommodations, and they don't necessarily all fit into um, you know, some of the same buckets where we've been thinking about resources for a, a long, long time that you know, basically we're only modeling uh, physical characteristics in our uh, master file information, things like that. So let's go on to the next slide and get into the proposal. Um, yeah, the ISO is proposing that co-located resources can elect, I, you know, I don't know if we're calling this a tool or a model, but some sort of operational features that are going to prevent on-site storage from receiving dispatch instructions in excess of co-located renewable output. Um, so basically, if you've got, a, you've got a, uh, a solar and a storage resource and the solar resource has a schedule of 10 megawatts, we're not, if you elect to use this functionality, we're not going to schedule the storage resource that's on-site to charge at more than 10 megawatts. That'll just be a rule that's observed by our market and uh, all of our market outcomes will always observe this. Um, the previous version um, had, a, had a, a somewhat lengthy and complex list of requirements to be able to elect this optionality. We're basically getting rid of all, all of that, um, th those hurdles. We're saying that any resource can elect this functionality. Um, if you're a co-located storage resource and you don't ever wanna be dispatched above to, to charge above what's coming off of your solar, yeah, you, you can opt into this. 
Um, there's no time limits. We were thinking about grandfathering and saying there could be a five year period or a period that matched investment tax credit length, something like that. We're, we're doing away with all that. We're saying that any resource can opt into this for as long as they want to. If your particular resource has a contract for ITC that expires after five years and you don't need this functionality after five years, that's fine. Uh, you can opt out of this after five years. If you want to keep on uh, this, this same plan, even after the five years, maybe this is relevant for some of the resources that have uh, property tax implications. That's fine, too. Um, the, the key here, and this is sort of where our operations team was emphatic, is that all resources on the grid must follow exceptional dispatch instructions. So if the ISO is in a reliability situation and our operations team is prescribing actions under those situations, um, they will not be taking the time to look and say, oh, is this a storage resource that has this optionality implemented or not? Um, they're not gonna be doing that. They're gonna be seeing resources that potentially have functionality and if they if the resources are the right resources and they can help with uh, you know emergency situations on the grid or potential uh, reliability situations on the grid when operators would be using exceptional dispatch the operators do retain the rights to exceptionally dispatch these resources um, and operate them anywhere within their operating parameters that they've submitted to the ISO. So if it's something you've got registered in master file and the resource is not on outage, um, you know, the operators could potentially exceptionally dispatch any storage resource on the grid in a way that could potentially force uh, grid charging. Now, I would, I would caveat that and say, you know, there's not a um, I would caveat that in a way and say that there's not a whole lot of situations where the ISO operators today need to exceptionally dispatch resources to uh, to, to charge from the grid. Um, typically, it's the opposite direction. It's discharge energy. Um, so I don't see this as something that happens necessarily uh, particularly often. Um, but but I think these are part of the rules of the road that if you want to use the co-located model. And if you want to be modeled as a storage resource, the ISO has to have the ability to uh, exceptionally dispatch you within that range, you know, under typical exceptional dispatch rules um, that would apply. Uh, so let me, I think I've got maybe one, maybe one, maybe two slides left. Um, so let's go through these and then I'll pause for questions or comments. Um, yeah, so essentially we're saying, yes, the ISO is going to allow these resources to observe contractual limitations. Um, we're basically saying our, our market is going to prevent any, you know, what what uh, is being referred to as grid charging from ever occurring. Um, and we're going to put that in as a limiter that the market observes or, or uh, inequality that the market observes. Um, we're also going a step farther than that. We're saying that if a storage resource needs to deviate down because a on-site renewable resource can't produce as much energy as they thought they could, you know, as forecast and as scheduled um, by the market, then those resources, those storage resources, have the ability to charge less and essentially match the output that's coming off of the solar resource. Um, this is similar to functionality that we implemented in the uh, hybrid resources initiative where um, co-located storage is allowed to deviate from dispatch instructions under certain cir circumstances when uh, solar would cause uh, generation in excess of the aggregate capability constraint in the upper direction. Um, well, you know, so, so a practical example of this would be, you know, a uh, solar and, and storage resource are co-located the ISO forecasts that the solar resource is going to have you know, 20 megawatts during one particular five minute interval, uh, and, and that's the output that it could provide. The ISO schedules the storage resource to charge for 20 megawatts during that same interval. In the actual operating time frame, uh, there could be you know, a, a particular point in time where the solar resource is operating, uh, clouds roll over the solar facility that the actual output of the resource declines from whatever it was producing at, you know, let's say 20 megawatts, which is the forecast, and actually declines to say 10 megawatts. 
um, in that interval and in time, um, the solar resource is allowed to deviate from its schedule, which is 20 megawatts down to 10 megawatts, and essentially follow um, that output from the, the uh, solar resource if, if it's dipped below um, what was anticipated in the market, Forec the forecast for the market. Um, the ISO is not, uh, you know, planning to send, you know, it, the ISO is not doing this optimization. This is something that needs to be implemented in software on the side of the house um, where the co-located resources would be located. Um, you know, not, not something that uh, the ISO would be doing. And at, at this point, after we send the dispatch instructions and you've got your awards from the market, it's, it's sort of out of the hands of the ISO. Um, the uh, storage resource, you know, under that same scenario where the solar output was only outputting 10, we would expect that the storage resource would only deviate from charging at 20 megawatts down to charging at 10 megawatts at that particular point in time. They couldn't, you know, deviate beyond those limits. So they couldn't deviate down to say, you know, five megawatts or two megawatts. Uh, they're still required to basically charge as much as they can um, up to that output from the solar resource. Um, the storage resource, if it's deviating, it could and will receive um, uninstructed imbalance energy awards um, during those times when it's not expressly following dispatch instructions. Uh, these are the same rules that we talked about in the hybrid resources initiative when storage resources were deviating. Um, during these situations, uh, you, you know, bas basically none of our settlement systems are gonna change. Um, we're just observing what the storage resource is doing and making, a, making settlements based on um, actual output of the storage resource. Uh, and yeah, th there's no, you know, no additional measures or, or tools to kind of monitor this on the ISO side and include that in, in the settlements process. So let me, yeah, so that is the last slide that I have on the co-located resources. I do have one final slide on pseudo ties. So let's go ahead and go through that. The, frankly, this hasn't changed um, since the last iteration of the proposal and we haven't really gotten a whole lot of comments on it. So I'm thinking this is this is pretty smooth sailing at this point, but let's just go through it to, um, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's. Today, uh, pseudo tied resources must show transmission capacity from the balancing authority that they're located in to the ISO if they're interconnecting with the ISO at the full rating of the resource. So this means if I interconnect a um, through the uh, pseudo type process, a solar resource and a storage resource, I have to have full transmission capacity for the solar resource and I have to have full transmission capacity for the storage resource. Um, th there was a request that, gee, if I have a, a solar and storage resource, uh, you're allowing, you know, the ISO is allowing the, um, those resources to use an aggregate capability constraint to monitor uh, or, or model the upper and lower limits of what those resources combined would ever uh, generate. And gee, it would make a lot of sense if you used an aggregate capability constraint for um, pseudo tie resources, that those resources uh, need not show full transmission capacity for the rating of the solar resource and the storage resource, but instead just show uh, full transmission capacity for the um, upper end of the rating for what would essentially be the aggregate capability constraint. So essentially that, that's what we're proposing here. Um, you know, and, and we've made a couple of other stipulations. Um, these resources must be located within the same balancing authority. Um, the aggregate capability constraint must be, be applied. I think we've also added a little bit more in, in terms of language in this in the paper, uh, but it's basically saying um, there may be some initial steps that have to be carried out between the uh, contracting party who's looking to interconnect pseudo tie resources and the origination balancing area to ensure that this is okay with them. But I think from an ISO perspective, um, we would be comfortable with, with putting these rules in place. Okay, so let me pause there. Um, I know we got a lot of feedback on this section, but, I, but I'm hoping that the changes that we made, first of all, were clear and that I, I really honestly believe that a lot of these changes we made were aligned with the feedback that we got from, from the stakeholders, which we really do appreciate. Um, and, and hopefully this proposal is much more in line with hopefully what everybody is thinking about um, how the co-located model should work going forward.
So Brenda, um, any comments or uh, raise hands? Yes. Yeah. Susan Schneider from Phoenix Consulting. You can go first. Great. Hi, Gabe. Um, hey, I want to thank you for, for listening to the comments that we put in. I know we had some uh, a lot to say about this, and I think you have addressed almost all of the issues we have. So I want to thank you for listening and for, for talking to make, you, making the operating folks uh, a little more comfortable and for, and for really, really paying attention to the stakeholder comments here. Um, I do have a few questions. One of them is, to the extent that you can make this election flexible, I think it will make the sto people more comfortable with making storage available, full storage capability available to the CAISO. So for example, if you don't have to do it as a, as a master file election, but you can do it say as an hourly flag or an hourly election or something like that, like, like per participation used to be, um, then I think that will be, I think people will be more comfortable depending on where they are with, with the limitations that they have for ITC, for example. So. I think uh, you know they might want to some hours make it available, some hours not, and I think you'll get more participation in the full market if you can make it a flexible election. Mm -hmm. So that's that's just an observation. Um, a couple of questions. So it sounds like the um, you're not going. This is not going to be a, a change. I, I guess if you look on, uh, there's no slide numbers here, but the slide. Um, if you go back uh, a slide and then one more. I guess one suggestion would be it'd be good to have. Um, I'm not sorry. One one slide later, it would be good to have a slide numbers. That would be one suggestion. I think, yeah, I think those might have disappeared because uh, <laughs> the one the one that says the market model will prevent these storage resources. If you get that one, okay, thank you. Um, so it sounds like these almost sound like. Well, first of all, it sounds like there's not. Um, this, this is not going to be a scheduling issue. So it's not going to be where. The schedule for for um, the output from the from the um, from the renewable resource would be a certain amount, and you're going to make sure the storage doesn't get a schedule for charging. It's going to be a real time dispatch -ish thing, right? Is that that's what it sounds like? Yeah. So yeah, we've got we've got we've got both aspects. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. The the first aspect is we're going to make sure that the schedules for the storage resources never exceed the output from the on-site renewables. The second aspect is kind of what we go down here. Yeah, okay, I, this... think, I think that's covered in the next slide. Um, but it's essentially saying yes, if if for some reason the solar resource or, or whatever renewable you've got can't produce at the forecast for whatever reason, um, then the storage resource is allowed to deviate to to prevent grid charging. Okay, well that's, but that's a, but that's a deviation is a real time thing. A schedule is, a, is an advancing, if you could just go back to the prior, I, this is not the right slide, it would do the other one, back, thank you. Um, it's, it's, it's different to say that the schedules will, for, for dispatch will not, or the, the schedule for, um, for the renewables um, and the schedule for the charging will be coordinated. It's a different thing to say that you can deviate from those schedules to the extent there are deviations from real time. And they're not incompatible, but I don't see, didn't see anything here about scheduling. This whole slide talks about deviations and dispatch instructions, not schedules like forward schedules. So, so when, I, when I'm saying dispatch instructions, I'm thinking about schedules. Okay. All right, so that okay, so that was my my next question, which is the two bullets here seem incompatible. So you're I, not, but not but what you just said. So the first one, the first one talks about you're you're not going to be the first one is is a scheduling thing. So when you talk about dispatch instructions, you mean dispatch instructions based on forward schedules, but you're actually also saying that the forward schedules themselves will be coordinated in that way. Correct. Okay. Now, do they in order to be coordinated, do they have to be um, bid into the same time frame. There's a must offer obligation for the storage that's, tw that's in the day ahead market. And the must offer obligation for the solar or wind, whatever it is, is, is real time. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the storage gets a schedule in the day ahead market to charge a certain amount in an hour, and then the solar gets a schedule in real time that is say less than that, would the schedule for charging the storage automatically be reduced to match the schedule for char for the for production of the solar. Yeah, everything is still done economically. So we, we run our day ahead market and we get, you know, a, a, a profile of schedules for all the resources, um, including the co-located solar and the co-located storage resources. And in that schedule that we generate 
from the day ahead market, we will ensure that for, for the resources that are opting into this functionality, that those schedules don't exceed the schedules that we have for, for the charging schedules don't exceed the schedules for the solar output. Okay, but there won't be, there may not be any solar yeah. solar schedule out of the day ahead market. Yeah, then we wouldn't see, if, if there's no schedule for solar output, then there wouldn't be a schedule for charging if the storage resource has opted into this um, model. Okay, and then when the solar comes in in and, and has a, has a schedule in real time, the real time market mm -hmm. bidding for scheduling, yep. then the storage might get a charging schedule then. Correct. Okay. It, as okay. long as it's scheduled for the solar. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. And then then these two bullets make sense because then the second bullet basically just says if you're you now you're trying to match it in the scheduling, but in real time things might be different and you can deviate from that to that extent. Yeah. Okay, so that's right. Okay. Okay. And then um, I think that's um, I think that's all I've got for right now. But thank you. I read again. Thanks for thanks for the modifications here. They're definitely a step in the right direction. Really positive. No, uh, I, 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 Susan, I know that you've been uh, advocating for this from the jump. Um, so we, we certainly appreciate you engaging in this and um, continuing to provide feedback. Uh, we, re we really appreciate it. And I, I will, uh, you know, in, internally socialize this idea about a potential hourly election instead of a master file parameter. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Next, we have Mary Washer for Tesla. Um, Gabe, you, you highlighted in an earlier slide that resources are still required to follow exceptional dispatch and operator instruction. Um, would this exceptional dispatch still be within the charge from co-located renewable constraints in that case? Yes, they would okay. be, yeah. Okay, understood, thank you. Yeah, uh, good question, yeah. Next we have Alva from PG Andy. Hello, Gabriel. This is uh, Alva from pg &E. um, I uh, There's just a couple of things. I think there's still, um, uh, I, and I appreciate the fact that you're responding to a, essentially an overwhelming request from participants for this, and you're moving this model closer to the hybrid model, which makes it more usable for a lot of people. But um, I think uh, one aspect of the original co-located resource model was that the storage model was identical to the storage model used um, by itself. And I don't think that's the case anymore because I think you'd, you'd actually be excluding these batteries from a number of um, uh, uh, ways in which state of charge would be managed both in your proposal and even currently. So um, I think it would be good to, uh, to define that out clearly just so it's understood. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing I thought thought might be a useful thing to consider based on sort of some of what Susan was alluding to the uh, the dynamic nature of the the, the, the battery scheduling might be to uh, make the, the the battery eligible for use of the dynamic limit tool so that um, mm -hmm. essentially it could provide a bid that would be meaningful. Um, I'm concerned about your point that um, the battery, if the, if, if, if the resource owner chose to provide no solar scheduled day ahead, there would be no charging on the battery, which would mean effectively in terms of the state of charge model, there'd be no discharge mm -hmm. except for the initial state of charge. That, that, that definitely troubles me, and I think that's, that's an area where it should be either thought about a little bit more, either in terms of whether there should be a requirement for a forecast that can be used to schedule um, the, the battery day ahead in some way, if it is supposed to have, uh, I mean, if it's got RA, then then the idea that you could just simply withhold uh, yeah. the capability of the battery day ahead would be would be troubling to, to me as a load serving entity. Um, so those are just, those are points that I think You'll be able to flesh out. I think you're you're you've moved a, 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 this ball a long ways along, and my and my aim is not to obstruct it, but just to say those things need to be addressed. Yeah, um, thanks for those comments, Alva. A, a lot of really good stuff there. Um, you know, I I, I I I don't dislike the idea about 
you know, thinking about how a uh, co-located resource could potentially use uh, di like something like the dynamic limit tool. Uh, my hesitation there is that, you know, I, I think we're all, well, most of us should be aware that the dynamic limit tool has been a relatively heavy implementation burden and our, our developers are still working on it. So this is, this is an aspect that we proposed, what, I, I think a year and a half ago, and it's still not in the market yet. Um, Assuming so it gets there, though, then then, then you should yeah. leverage it for other uses. If it if it's not there, I'm not I'm not gonna I, I wouldn't ask yeah. for it. But, but so I'm a little bit hesitant to make promises about developing right. more policy on top of it before we've even implemented the first policy. But I do, I, I I think you're right. I think there actually may be even more applications even outside of storage where we could start leveraging um, some right. of the functionality of the dynamic limit yeah. tool if it's implemented in the proper way. Right. Um, I agree. So. Yeah. I know some of our internal folks are thinking about that and I'll continue to advocate for that sort of uh, expansion of use outside of uh, the traditional just for hybrid resources. Um, so, so, but, I'll, but I'll keep that in mind. Um, and, and, I, and I like what you're, you know, I, I like what you and Susan were both saying about some of the solar hours. Maybe we need to put a little bit more thought into the day ahead schedules here because um, you're right, we could come up with some really weird outcomes that, that may not, be good for anybody. Um, so, so we'll, we'll we'll continue to think about that as we move into uh, you know some some of the final drafting here. Thank you. But thanks for the comments, Alva. Next, we have Doug from Flynn Consultants. Hi, Doug Bocciagnone from Flynn Resource Consultants. Um, Gabe, I also want to echo the the comments, thanking you for listening and, and incorporating these changes. I think it's a big improvement. Um, Regarding the, you know, the scheduling in the day ahead, I wonder if, if you could, it seems like it might be helpful to, to allow the, the, re, the scheduling coordinator to say, okay, here's my day ahead forecast. You can, you know, optimize the, the charging, uh, you know, subject to the limitation of the forecast. Um, and then that way you would know going, you know, after, when you run the day ahead market, what the scheduled charging, you know, and solar that corresponds with that mm -hmm. is. Because otherwise you have to sort of manage it, you know, either with bids or you, you have to sort of, you have to show up in real time to do the charging. And that doesn't seem good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then just a comment, it's not in your presentation, but it was in the, the revised straw proposal regarding rain penalties. I think you, you mentioned that if the, the resource uh, isn't charged, you know, so it's a zero state of charge and there's no uh, solar available that you'd have to submit an outage card. And I kind of want to push back on that a little bit because I mean, this is a use limited resource. You know, there's other use limited resources that I don't think are subject to rain penalties mm -hmm. um, when their fuels fully utilized. Um, and it just seems like, you know, the, the resource is getting optimized in the market and, you know, it's set up to be fully charged and then potentially fully discharged. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like you'd be penalizing it if it gets discharged. And I, you know, you might then be giving people an incentive sort of similar to what we, you talked about this morning on the regulation. It, yeah. To sort of retain, you know, five minutes of mm -hmm. energy in the storage at all times, which, you know, that may not be the most efficient way yeah. to do things. Well, I'm certain it wouldn't be the most efficient way to do things. Yeah. Yeah, Doug, um, I, I think that that's a really good comment. And and frankly, I think that whole section um, sort of got revised heavily uh, from the last version of the section I, because, because initially uh, we had sort of been running this initiative in tandem with the um, RA Enhancements Initiative. And I think since then, you know, the RA Enhancements Initiative has been put to some extent on, on a little bit of a back burner for now, 
Um, and I think we've sort of been waiting for uh, some outcomes at the CPUC to, to start that back up. Um, but but I, I, I think the language that you're referring to was sort of some commentary on, on where we are right now with storage policy and where we think we might go in the future with um, the RA enhancements work that we were planning at the time, um, which now, you know, I, I, I'm presuming we're gonna pick that back up at some point, uh, but we had been making progress on that in the past, but it, it really hasn't gone very far in the last couple of months. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll continue to look at that and, and think about what's there in the paper. And I suspect the the right conversation for this topic is in our enhancements when it gets, you know, going again. Um, and I think to I probably Carrie's earlier point, uh, yeah, probably another uh, good call out for hey, what are all the relationships between all of the uh, you know initiatives and enhancements that that involve storage right now? Because there's a lot going on. Um, but I think this is just one more kind of element of um, what, what's happening there. Yeah, I, I think you may be right. Although the way the statement is still in there basically says, you know, if if it's not charged and yeah, and you don't have solar available, you've got to take an outage, and there and be subject to rain. Let me and, yeah, you take a and look. That seems like yeah. it could be really unfair because. You know, in a few hours, it's going to get fully charged and, sure. and be providing the resource adequacy during the hours when you be capable of providing it in the hours when you, you know, planned on needing it. So, okay. yeah, seems yeah. A little Thank harsh. yeah, thanks for that feedback. Uh, we'll take a look at that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Brenda, I think you've noted to me that there are two hands uh, raised in the queue right now, um, and I see we're at 1151. So I'll maybe say let's limit. Uh, both call, both uh, questions to three minutes, and then um, I do want to give you a couple minutes to wrap up. Thank so, you. Maybe, first question. Raul, let's go ahead and unmute your line. Hey, Gabe, this is Rahul from AES. Uh, so, you know, I want to echo others' comments that really a good step in the right direction for managing ITC. Uh, my question is very similar to, you know, what... Uh, Susan had asked, I think it would make sense if you could provide the formulation or more details of how this would be implemented. And that would give a really good idea for everyone to think through uh, how you know, it will impact uh, bidding or schedule. So one of the things that comes to mind is if someone has a regulation award and the AGC signals, would they also respect the restriction or it's only the market schedules? So, you know, that's something if you provide clarification in the implementation should answer those kind of questions. Uh, that was one request. And the second request was, you know, I think similar to regarding the outage description, it was, it's there in the paper, but not in the presentation. So I just want to make sure the intent is what's in the paper, not necessarily what's in the presentation. Right. So yeah. you're you know, the, the, the paper and ultimately the, the final proposal and you know the documentation we put forward to the board and the documentation we submit to FERC is is sort of what, what stands in our rules. Um, and, and the idea would be that you know the, the, the second revised straw proposal, that document and this presentation would inform um, those those future iterations. So, you know, it would be good to know the details of when the outage card sub should be submitted because it's, okay. it can get a little complicated of, you know, what exactly is expected. It's pretty high level and that's good for this conversation, okay. but moving forward. So those are the two things and okay, great. thank you for my time. Yeah, thanks Rahul, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of envision, well, I don't think we'd really thought too far into how like AGC instructions would work. But my suspicion there would be that we'd probably be on the side of, uh, or, or err on the side of, you know, if you're getting regulation awards, you still need to respond to AGC, um, and those wouldn't necessarily be, you know, in, incorporating basically what's happening at a, at a solar resource on a four-second basis. But I think that's a good point uh, of clarification. 
So I see it's 1154. Um, I did promise one more, if there's one more hand, uh, Brenda, uh, and I'm, we're going to limit that to three minutes just so we do have a little bit of time to wrap up. Okay. We have Susan who raised her hand again. Just want to confirm. You have a question? Yes, and it will definitely be less than three minutes. Okay. Um, first, I wanted to, to echo what Doug had said because I thinking about it as we were talking, I think the um, the idea of, of putting in something in the day ahead, the, the CAISO for resources that are in PERP, the CAISO has sure. a forecast already sure. for um, for those kind of variable resources and, and can use it. It doesn't make sense not to provide any charging schedule at all, but simply perhaps to adjust for, okay. with the real-time scheduling process if it turns out that the forecast is high or low. So I think that does actually make sense. And then uh, I did want to echo also the, the rain concerns. Um, we, we definitely don't want to be using that dynamic limit tool, by the way, <laughs> because we're, you know, that wasn't a big, we weren't big fans of that. But but um, but the, the rain penalties, especially if that's going to be extended into UCAP in any way, there's somehow there's going to be an outage um, for a resource that is actually designed to do what you've told it to. And if you tell it to discharge all the way, then it's, then that's what it did. And you shouldn't be pun punching uh, the resource for it. So yeah, definitely some concerns about the rain, the rain issue. Yeah. So I wanted to echo that. So that's, um, that's all. And, um, and then I think, uh, yeah, then, and again, for AES, the, the additional details on regulation, I think a lot of these resources obviously are going to be providing it and we'll need to yeah. know how that all interacts. So yeah. um, I'm done. Thanks. Well, well, thanks for that uh, follow up, Susan. Uh, that's great. Um, I think we have exactly five minutes left. So Brenda, I will turn it over to you and you can conclude. Thank you, Gabe. What a great meeting. Thanks for everyone who participated with their questions and comments. And thank you, Ali, for having that um, quick um, review for his part. For today's next steps, we have provided you the link here for the energy storage enhancement. The common template will be available within the next hour or so. So feel free to visit the link and go to the common template to provide your comments for the second revised draw proposal. Those are due on July 20th, so be courteous of that time. We are extending it a little bit for everyone, but um, we do want to make sure that you meet that July 20th deadline to submit. And lastly, but not least, we have a stakeholder symposium coming on November 9th and 10th. You will be able to register now and add and let your um, employers know that it's open to everyone that we have. We have a, a approximately a lot of great things getting ready for this year's symposium. At this time, we don't have the agenda released or any of those information, but um, as we progress, we will have notices going out on that information. But if you do have any questions on the symposium registration, feel free to email us at symposiumreg at kaiso.com. But other than that, that would wrap up our meeting for today. And we appreciate your guys' participation for this call, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. And we could that go ahead and that concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.